Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good golly, Miss Molly. Welcome, everybody, to the Canon Film Club, rebranded at no expense whatsoever. <laughs> Not at great expense, but at no expense. The rebranded Canon Film Club, in the strangely in the same slot as its only talk and roll, which is kind of weird. But uh, Funny how that works. Funny how that works. Funny how that works. I hope everybody liked the new opening montage yeah. it's very cool man yeah dog it ever <laughs> see every time i see dolph lundgren man my my bro my brother is the biggest dolph lundgren fan yeah. walking the planet he I thinks see. that guy is the greatest actor that ever lived when he's got dolph, every movie he's ever made so what you're saying is when there's a dolph movie on there's not a dry seat in the house nope not not <laughs> at my brother's house no doubt <laughs> telling you uh, well, welcome, folks. Uh, welcome to everyone in the chat. I really, that's, uh, yeah, we thought we'd do a little bit of rebranding because we'll be doing a lot of these canon shows of the next months and years, I hope. Uh, and on, But on today's show, we are going to be discussing the saga of Paul Kersey, the world's unluckiest man. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> Whatever you also, do. Possibly the only thing more dangerous than being a crook in Paul Kersey's city is being married to Paul Kersey. Being married or somehow associated <laughs> with Paul. You, whatever you do, you don't want to be a family member or a friend. Of yeah. Paul, no. Because you're marked for death. Unless you're the guy Joel, is a pariah. Joel, don't be anywhere near him. Unless you're Joel yeah. Ireland, you might get away with it. Um, <laughs> neither do you want to be a cop or a gang member or a mobster or indeed even a random passerby. No, in some cases, yeah, unless you are Paul Kersey, there's a good chance you're Paul. going to die due to Paul Kersey related incidents. That's right, Paul, <laughs> they actually changed all the coroner's forms to have a box for Paul Kersey related. <laughs> <laughs> and if you touch his dick, you are That's going right. to die. You are yeah. going to die. Like, there <laughs> is no if, ands, or buts. At some point in the next 36 hours, you're probably going to die. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a universal and, law of and there's a very good Kersey, chance you are dead. And there's yeah. a very good chance you'll die from an explosive projectile of some kind. That's yeah. yes. yes. And and um, but 
Yeah, following the, the eight-year hiatus after the success of Death Wish in 1974, Canon, by dint of just pretending they belong, it belonged to them anyway, uh, revived <laughs> the franchise, um, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, going forward. And they made a leading man action star in North America, particularly of Charles Bronson, who was always a big star in Europe, or had been for many, many years, but had never reached that total leading man status in a major movie and of course death which made a lot of money so kind of sealed his position as a leading man action star even at, 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 for him the advanced stage of what was he 60 uh, austin when he starred in death wish 2 or yeah he was just about there yeah yeah uh so today we're going to be screaming for vengeance i've always wanted to use that line in a <laughs> in a show uh, and we're going to be talking all things Death Wish with an emphasis on the official canon movies of 2, 3, and 4. We will talk a little bit about Death Wish 1 and 5, but mainly 2, 3, 4 is the focus. We've got a lot of clips, a lot of images, some interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for being here in the chat. So far, we got a lot of people. It's uh, getting busy. Please uh, like and share and all that good stuff. Um, the giggler, yes, we just shot the giggler. <laughs> they just shot the giggler, man. Um, no. The character names are even fantastic in some of these. So we're some one of the yeah. greatest lines of all, of like most memorable lines in movie history. But they <laughs> shot the giggler. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so we're definitely going to be covering a lot of that. We're going to look at some of the key players, um, and we'll be running back and forward to the chat, and keeping an eye on you guys, and seeing what you got to say. There is a poll in the chat, which will be up there for a while, which is your favorite of those three canon ones. A lot of people have been saying that four are amongst their favorite movies, and maybe even three is their favorite, even their favorite canon movie. I think there's a good case to be made for that. I mean, three, particularly the last 20 minutes of Death Wish 3, is just phenomenal. Uh, re-watching these again recently to do this show and, and re-watching them two or three times to get clips and so on, I actually remember, they, they actually seem better to me than I remembered from back in the day and seeing them at the cinema and then renting them on VHS. So I don't know whether it's nostalgia or what, but I thought three and four, these are really good movies, you know, so um, definitely want to talk about that. Uh, but welcome to the panel. Um Tom uh, will not be joining us today for technical, he's having some technical problems. We hope Razor will still be able to drop in uh, at some point. And, um, uh, but we have a regular panelist, but we also have an extra special guest uh, again. Thank you for joining us, Austin Trunick. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks yes. for inviting me. Oh, no problem, it's great to have you here because I can throw lots of questions at you that you can answer that I'll be unable to answer because you are the definitive canon movies guy the man i'll do my best the man who wrote the canon film guides and indeed is still writing them i hope don't plug in away yeah so if you've not seen these i urge you to to check out austin's books canon film guide volume one and two absolutely essential handbooks as I was saying before we started to Austin, I've reread the Death Wish chapter in the first film guide about 18 times to prep for this. It's just a, a gold mine of information. So you can buy these on Amazon, Kindle, and, and if so hard copies you can buy on Amazon. You can get them on Kindle and other book services. Uh, and this is the uh, your official website, Austin, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for showing that up there. Oh, no problem. It's, it's our pleasure to have you on the stream thank you very much for being here um but i still have my regular wonderful panelists here uh who are all keen to get stuck into this and especially pope i know you're very keen to talk about weapons which we will get to oh god yes the there are some really point. fun ones in this franchise and also hollywood has apparently a very loose grasp on how some other ones work so we'll get to that yeah a loose gra Hollywood has a loose grasp on weapons and, and how to handle them. Hmm. I mean, other than Alec Baldwin, <laughs> that man will shoot you dead nine times out of ten. That, that but never misses. <laughs> never misses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, oh, we'll get to we'll certainly be getting to that, especially in Death Wish 3. We have some some nice images to show from that. Uh Joe, welcome to the show. How are you? 
I am doing fantastic, buddy. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to get into some revenge porn. What about you? Yeah, we can see the back of your head, which is awesome. You just keep it <laughs> keep it on the back of your head. It's much more pleasant. <laughs> no, nah, man. Uh, Watch these a long time ago. Good Lord, man. Time passes too fast. It seems like yesterday these movies came out. And yeah, Bronson was not young when he starred in them. Uh, any of them uh, i think mm. he was in uh, almost 50 when he started in the first one uh but uh Indeed. yeah love uh, love this kind of stuff it, i mean this character spawned an entire genre of revenge porn man that, that goes on mm. to this day yeah indeed and everybody i think everybody loves a good revenge story and, and you know it and a vigilante story i mean just look it. at john wick they kill the guy's dog and it's full yeah. <laughs> <later. laughs> film rampage. <laughs> Good Lord. It's still going. Thank and God he didn't have a cat as well. I mean, you know, as somebody who, who's uh, grown up with dogs, you shoot my dog. Yeah. You're not walking away from it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and, uh, I mean, Hurting animals is one of the surefire ways you see my ancestors come out in me. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, absolutely. It's. Uh, it, I agree. I think we all agree. We'd all do the same thing. And uh, Imp, yeah, uh, good to see you, or at least to see the small circle in the middle of the screen that represents you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> like I said, I've always said I've got a face for radio. So, <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Oh um, yeah, buddy. Anytime. And, uh, are you? Were you a particular fan of the Death Wish movies growing up? I as a child? was. Um, like. Joe was saying, I hadn't seen him in a while, but I went back and watched a couple of them over the weekend. Mm. And I got to say, three is still my favorite one. Three is pretty. It's pretty it good. also happens to be the first one that I saw when I was younger, but it has that vibe of being an 80s movie, mm. being slightly over the top, but not hitting the pure insanity that the mid to late 80s hit. Yeah, I, I yeah. think like Death Wish Three is kind of like the perfect, like ideal form if you want to go platonic on it of what a Death Wish movie is. Interesting, yeah, yeah, I I could see that, and and I think we will definitely discuss that as we're going through the movies. Uh, I think when we get to talking about Death Wish One briefly and then Death Wish Two, I think they've got a very different tone from Three and Four. Yeah, uh, and it, it's not that the three and four are more lighthearted, although there is some amusement in them and some jokes. Uh, I think that, that he just changes the way he operates. Yes, he uses bigger weapons, but he also uses his brains too and sets up various things like the wine bottle stuff and so on. So, True. Um, so it becomes well, a bit more you fun. You only get so many girlfriends murdered before you just you know stop caring. <laughs> I know, and you should never <laughs> let them drive a car on their own. Never, never let them be in the house on their own. Never, yeah, whatever. Um, so, and uh, finally, but last, but definitely not least uh, at the moment, there may be others joining us, I hope, uh, is John Das Wolfen. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Yeah. And what's your experience with these movies? I saw my first one when I was 14. It was the original Death Wish. And mm. uh, I, was, I was hooked. It's just uh, one of those series that uh, grabs you and takes you on a ride that that not a lot of not a lot of movies at the time were doing indeed and, and i think they've left an indelible mark uh on on a lot of people um <laughs> left a lot of marks on the people at the receiving end of of uh, Kersey's, uh, actions but the uh one of the things that that i i was thinking of compiling a bunch of critical reviews just to read them out because this these were not Particularly well received movies by no, the critics. Of course not. No, of course Although, not. Critics? Yeah. Are you Nothing kidding me? Said, if the critics hate it, chances are we're going to like it. Well, right? that, that's, I was just, that was the point I was going to make because they really they didn't like um, uh, the, the vigilante aspect. They didn't like the revenge killing aspect. They didn't like the violence, which they saw as excessive, that there was possibly innocent bystanders there, there was no due process. All those criticisms were made of it by the usual. Suspects. I, I think I, I tend to agree with them a little bit about some of the the more um, Michael Winner esque revenge, uh, sort of almost porn masochism violence in the first couple of movies. There's there's some of that I think is a little bit. Uh, Michael Winner seemed to be into that. Let's put it that way. I made it a very yeah. hard shoot, particularly in Death Wish Two. I believe the six days worth of 
horrible shooting for the actors. Um, so he may be, and they, they backed off that in three and four uh, very much, I thought. So those, those I could see some legitimate criticisms there. Other than that, I mean, the, the time Death Wish 1 was made, 74, cities were a mess. New York City was a mess, and the first one set in Manhattan, I believe. And these people were saying, what are we going to do? Crime is rampant, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a, it touched a nerve for people. In many ways. Um, in fact, let's uh, let's so let's just take a little bit of get into it about some of the key players um, before we move on to the movies themselves. Um, first of all, Austin, you Austin, you this has nothing to do with Death Wish, but you tweeted this out earlier. Is this a real advert? Well, the, the shorts are not. Somebody uh, took these shorts <laughs> off of him. <laughs> the action jeans, his action pants were were real, and you can actually still buy them. They're not Chuck Norris branded, but the company still makes Chuck Norris That's action true. action Unbelievable. jeans. Unbelievable! If you want to, if, if you if you need tight blue jeans that allow with extra room in the crotch for like high kicking. Yeah, I I just couldn't resist. Um... Couldn't resist because <laughs> I do follow you. If ever we should follow the Canon Film Guide on Twitter, um, we'll try and get that link in the uh, in the uh, the chat later. And it's uh, you're always tweeting these gems out that you find. Um, and seventies yeah, didn't let me have a pair of these. Well, he probably did, but then probably his girlfriend did too. So, you know. <laughs> um, well, actually, I forgot. But Austin, sorry, I forgot. Can we see that wonderful poster you've got behind you? Oh. Sure, sure. This is a Death Wish, Death Wish Five, a video five. store poster. <laughs> Death Wish Five, the twenty-first century film production. Yes, nineteen ninety-four release. I was just marveling earlier today that yeah, the there there's been a Charles Bronson Death Wish sequel more recently than a Wayne's World movie, which is yep. just wow. Should not be a real thing. <laughs> That's right. Death Wish Five, the Face of Death. Is the yeah so know, deadly I, they had to put death twice in the title. <laughs> the face of just to make sure you read you read the poster and it makes it look like a Judge Dread movie, man. No yeah, judge, yeah. no jury, no appeals. You know, I'm no deals. More scared right? of Paul Kersey than jo than Joseph Dredd at some points, at least from the '93 <laughs> movie. So yeah, sentient dildo. Um, believes that I, I wear them when I wash my Corvette. Well, it's not a Corvette, it's a Mercury, but otherwise you're correct. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, yeah, someone's got their Bruce Levi's. Pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, just to go back to some of these images then. So the star of the show, I, I mean, you could do multiple shows about this man alone. Yep. The magnificence that is... Charles Bronson, born Charles Dennis Buczynski in the, the coal mining areas of Pennsylvania in 1921, of Lithuanian descent, the 11th of 15 children. Wow. I mean, well, they didn't his, have TV back then. Well, so, that's right. I was going to say, his parents must have been forever in the bedroom, like locked in the bedroom. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Um, and when his dad died, he was only about 10 years old. I didn't know any of this till I really looked into it. And he's, he, he actually went down the coal mines as a kid to help provide for the family. Like they all had to, the kids, the boys all had to go to work. And, yeah, especially living in, well, yeah. just south of there, um, towards the Virginia side. Things yeah. worked a little differently back then, where Indeed. You know, education was a bonus. And most people didn't finish the eighth grade because they needed to help their their father in their business, or you know they needed to support their family. Clearly, he was doing a very, he was leading a very privileged life. I could see that, but um, mm -hmm. but then uh, like uh, something that appeals to me about him was that he served as a tail gunner in World War Two and bombers. Because my my father was a flight engineer in Lancaster bombers in World War Two, so I feel a lot of uh, affinity for him. Twenty five missions and a Purple Heart, so. These guys, like in that era in Hollywood, not like many of the Hollywood men today, were the real deal, you know. Well, I yeah. mean, we make fun of the Air Force all the time now, but back then, especially, there, like every time you went up in a B twenty four or a B seventeen or whatever, yeah. there was like a twenty five percent chance you weren't coming oh, yeah. home. Who makes fun of the Air Force? <laughs> I, I did. I, 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 my brother was in the Air Force, and I was in the Army, so I, I, I always mess with him about it. 
Yeah. I'm in the Marine Corps. Great I was in the Marine Corps. We make fun of the Air Force constantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this this is one of. I know he had a long career uh, as you know, he was a mild mannered guy, but he always played a lot of masculine masculine guys on screen. Quite as you can see, he's a brawny guy. You know, mm -hmm. dozens of memorable supporting parts, a lot of leads in B movies. This is uh, let's face Machine, it, with a Gun like that, Machine Gun Kelly. How can you not say? How can you say no to him? I know he just looks the part. Mm -hmm. So Machine Gun Kelly, a great. Uh, um, Roger Corman movie, and he just he couldn't cast that role better, you know. Wasn't he in the Dirty Dozen? Wasn't he in that he was. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, sir, how are you? I thought I'd stop by for a little bit anyway and try oh, it. Oh, appreciate it, mate. Hey, Thank Tom. you. I, I know you've been having some issues technically, and you're also extremely busy. So, <laughs> um, snowed under busy. So, thanks for being here, mate. Yeah, no problem. But uh, yeah. Death Wish is a heck of a franchise. It is indeed, and we're we're going over just a little bit of uh, Charles Bronson right now and his history. So when it got up to the 60s, he started to get some of these really memorable supporting parts, uh, particularly in Europe, where he became a big star. I mean, I'm from Europe, albeit the Celtic part, and I think he was better known for us in Europe than he might have been in North America through films like well, Once Upon a Time in the West, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The dirt, uh, the Great Escape, which is like st a staple of British television, really was growing up. Yeah. That was the Christmas movie we all watched. Wow, that's cool. hard. The Great Escape, Great where Escape, he played huh? the Tunnel King. Mm -hmm. So he was really well known because of all of these. Uh, the Magnificent Seven. I mean, come on. Even I mean, even I'm getting fairly moist at that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at the fucking shoulders on this guy. Like he was a, like you say, he was built like a brick shit house. He was. He was a, a strong, brawny guy. Um, classic action star. Not the action stars of today who do all the, you know, they've got all the choreography or whatever. I mean, just a tough guy, you know. And then, of course, that's sorry, when you start using a pickaxe in a in a mine in West Virginia at the mm -hmm. age of at ten years 10. old. Exactly. Yep. It tends to yeah. build muscles and character. Uh, so The Dirty Dozen, another cla brilliant movie. Just, I, I mean, I, I watch these movies at least once a year. All these movies, they're just so yeah. good. Uh, so uh, Death Wish, though, finally made him that kind of breakthrough leading man star in, in uh, the US as well as the star. I mean, it wasn't like he was unknown, but no. Finally had his name above the headline, you know. Uh, but then he worked with it. So another key guy in these these movies uh, is obviously Michael Winner, British director. Uh, weird choice to make anything like Death Wish, but there you go. He made a lot of thrillers in his day, a lot of British movies, and he directed one, two, and three. Also wrote them. Well, overwrote them, I think you would say, Austin. That's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> he overwrote the, the scripts um, here he is in the set of the first Death Wish with uh, Charles Bronson and him and Bronson got on really well which is why Bronson wanted him to well, come back let's, to I mean you almost have to acknowledge where Death Wish comes from all of this stems to, to basically from Dirty Harry yeah. um, and the success of Dirty Harry and uh, there was a couple other films uh, that haven't quite lived on in that period I can't even remember the names of some of them but it was a lot of anti-hippie culture movement kind of mm -hmm. films where you basically would have a conservative character, you know, going up against the progressive at the time. Like, you got to imagine, this is if they came out with a movie right now where basically the lead character was like a cop or or what have you. And he, the whole movie was him just plowing down a bunch of woke SJW woke people. Well, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not yeah. a coincidence that yeah. they came out with a remake of the original Death Wish three years ago. Yeah, although it was not very good. It yeah. wasn't great, but they tried. <laughs> they, tried. Yeah, they did try. They it tried. Was, it was more of just to cash in on the name than it was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, like going from there, like uh, Death Wish itself, like it, it was kind of the same thing with like D Dirty Harry. Like none of the critics at the time gave it any time of day outside of the fact that they did acknowledge that it would be a conservative's wet dream at that time mm. but what happened was is these movies became crowd pleasers among some very like you gotta also remember the type of movies that were coming out in the early 70s we hadn't gotten jaws in star wars yet right no. 
Like no. this is coming um, out amongst shit like The Exorcist, Rosemary, you know, Rosemary's Baby, uh, fucking um, Godfather, you know, all kinds of very serious film fare. Dark where, stuff, yeah. Dark the stuff, 70s you know, were a dark Rider, time for films and stuff, yeah. Death Death Wish does instance, not yeah. pull punches. Like mm -hmm. some of the scenes in the first couple of Death Wish movies get fucking dark. They do, they do. But the, the crime in New York City, particularly in that era, my wife actually well, just was, between li the was living the, near yeah. there. She, she was, was living in New there. Jersey at the time in those early seventies. It was bad in in New York City, and people kind of like the idea of someone cleaning it up because <laughs> the cops weren't going to do it, you know. So it did strike that nerve. Uh, but uh, Winner and, and Bronson had worked together a lot. Here's uh, the, the movie about Paul Chato, uh, Chato's land, Paul playing the lead. Um, uh, the mechanic. He's like, hello, which, Denison's. Which is I a am Paul Chato, played by Paul Chato. Charles Bronson. That's right. <laughs> That's, uh, the mechanic's a brilliant movie. Don't I sound well. Canadian to you? A was there. Oh, hey. now you see, I have a video for that, Tom. It's funny you should say that. Great day for hey, hey, boys. Did you get her done? Just kidding, we don't give a... <laughs> <laughs> Let her Kenny, for anyone who doesn't... Yeah, then Bronson had a ton of films that were either uh, Death Wish clones and or um, clones of other films. <laughs> Well, he certainly played either the disaffected cop or the vigilante or yeah. the, yeah, <laughs> quite a lot. And many of them were J. Lee Thompson, who directed Death Wish 4. A lot of them were, were Michael Winner. He did seem to get on with Winner. Um, Michael Winner, of course, did a lot of British movies back in the day, including this nudist colony epic, which got round the censors because it was about naturism. Check it out. There are clips online. <laughs> Some like it cool. So he had a, he had done a ton of British movies, moved into doing some thrillers and uh, some American stuff. Uh, he was now winner was on board at one point. Austin, correct me if I'm wrong, to direct the and we can make a whole show about it. The Captain America movie they didn't make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember. yeah, he wrote one of the first uh, Captain America scripts for for Canon. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in late oh, '84, early '85 is when he got on board there. Yeah, I'm that kept I'm trying to picture the glory of a Canon Films Captain America. <laughs> well, they were going to do. Well, you already did get it. It's technically it exists. Albert Payune directed it, and it was uh, produced, but only by uh, half of the team. That was the 21st century. Oh, it was the 21st century. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's yeah. one of the projects he took with him. Yeah. yeah, it was a go boy, not a go go boy. Yeah, I'd be uh, I'd be surprised if Michael Winner's version didn't start with Steve Rogers, like family getting. Horribly assaulted, <laughs> <Slow. laughs> like, like the Punisher, and, and graped. Yeah, it would have been this like six well, minutes I mean, of grape. That's kind Steve of Rogers' family was Michael killed. And, right. It's just like, oh yeah, it, it, like you know, he has this horrible backstory. It's like, no, no, no that's the backstory for the Punisher. This yeah, I, I was gonna say, this guy probably was the inspiration for the guy that made the back Mac Boland series, if you know what I'm talking about. There, mm -hmm. that was the inspiration for the Punisher in the in the comic books. And um, I love the fact that they made Frank Castle a Marine because I know, being one, I know Marines very well, and we very much are the creatures that would turn into Frank Castle. Mm -hmm. Of I do really bad shit to bad people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So another a guy we need to mention, although he only directed Death Wish 4, was J. Lee Thompson, so like, go-to guy for canon and directed multiple canon the films, including out. with uh, like 10 to Midnight with, with Bronson. And, uh, mm. But yeah, such an accomplished director. Cape Fear, Guns of Navarone. You can see it in in 4 that there's a certain directing style that he uses and it's, it's extremely good. It makes mm. the movie way better well, than you would expect it to be. I think there's one trick to it all. You just keep giving Charles a bigger gun in each movie. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. Well, until he ends up You're with a, a rocket launcher. Surprised he didn't get one of those Navarone uh, artillery pieces. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so that's the three of the key players. I mean, there's, we're going to go through some of the other characters that are in these movies and whatever as we go. Um, but just to go back to let's where it all started, although again not a canon movie, was it was Dino De Laurentiis was the first Death Wish, which is weird because Dino is almost kind of like how do you put it? Like canon was almost like dime store Dino De Laurentiis in a weird yeah, way. You could actually yeah. see, yeah, you can yeah, see that some of the movies and exist. Did, you can, and we just talked about you know another deal, uh, Dino film last week with you know Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon, and, yeah. 
it does feel like a canon film a little bit. It, it does, and it had canon people in it. I think, Austin, you pointed out uh, uh, Melody Anderson was in canon yeah. movies. And mm -hmm. This original, though, wasn't uh, quite as over the top as most canon movies are, though. No. It was a little bit more concerned. No, no, the original film I would actually put on the level of, like I said, Dirty Harry. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Especially in the period of time. Like, look, there's very few films of that era that have lived on just because it was such a different time period. Like the handful that I mentioned are some of the few that people remember of that time period. This is yeah. one of them. It's mm -hmm. in that pantheon of films. Like there's, there's only so many great films that came out of the early, early, early 70s until we really they started hitting their stride in Hollywood. And then, of course, you can make an argument for the 70s being the greatest era. I will mm. listen to that argument. But mm. up to that point, like outside of The Godfather and a few other things, there was a lot of crap in the early yeah, 70s. And, yeah. and, and Death Wish, the, it would normally be a little pot boiler that wouldn't do shit, right? It would have just been ignored and forgotten, like most of Charles' movies, sadly, are, are now. But what was mm -hmm. different about it was he was an everyday guy, and it, the story was so simplistic. The, the the attack and assault in the beginning of the film was so random and so visceral and in your face that yes. you as the audience, regardless of you're somebody who's like totally anti-gun, totally hippie, you can almost get yourself to a point where you're just like, yes, yeah, I can see why this guy flipped. You know, and decided mm -hmm. I'm going to go out and, and just start wasn't randomly he killing. Kind of an anti gun lib at the beginning of the movie. The the movie? Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, is I think that's different from the novel. Correct me if I'm wrong, Austin, because this is the one thing the Bruce Willis one I think did go back to the novel is in the original novel. I think he is a doctor. So that kind of goes against like his whole thing. Of, I was fixing to say he's some kind of professional. Isn't he's he? a yeah. doctor, I think. In the right. movie, they make him. A, he was a. He, I think they, they mentioned. Well, yeah, he's an architect, but I think they mentioned that he did work as an as a doctor in in uh, the Korean War. I think it was or whatever, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. or something it, like that. But uh, yeah, again, Austin, don't have to correct me if I'm wrong. He's an architect, Tom. Um, he's an architect, but he builds buildings with machine gun nests, sniper posts. Uh, <laughs> 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 I. I I think uh, the easiest is, way to look at how this series goes is, and sort of how grounded it is. It, he kills le there's there's less than a dozen people killed in the first movie versus mm. Death Wish three where it's eighty some. It's the body <laughs> count gets amped up as well. well yeah, he yeah. gets like one of the guys that actually assaulted his wife, right? I think. Yeah, none of yeah. Yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he starts to to to. We'll come back to this picture in a minute. He starts to to oh, widen his scope from revenge to just cleaning up the block. So I just wanted to, before we go any further, thank our great friend, uh, my great friend Christian Delorme, who donated twenty five Canadian Nuka Cola caps, uh, and his message of, of peace and love was uh, not vengeance, was happy belated birthday, Brian. Sorry, I missed your shows last week. Well. No problem, mate. I know you're out working, and I'm glad you've got that uh, great job, and you're working hard at that. So, best wishes to you too, mate. And thanks for being here. And I think I've probably got a video clip for that. It's probably this one. <laughs> for being a dick to Clark Kent. <laughs> so, thank you, Christian. Um, so, just. We're not going to linger on Death Wish one uh, too much, but it was it was a significant hit. Like I think it made like five times its money back. Oh yeah, it, it was a huge hit, huge, huge hit. hit, and a huge cultural milestone. A lot of people talking about it, attacking it, supporting and it. And for uh, and for uh, you know on its on the face of it, pretty basic action movie. It does kind of have that mm. deeper meaning of like you know it puts the audience in the position of Paul. Of you're just an average guy trying to go about his average life and then this shit happens to you what would you do yeah, yeah. and it, there's, there's a movie that I, I can't recall the name of it that um jody foster movie where she gets revenge on her attackers oh, oh that's uh, right. the accused yeah, or, is it yeah, yeah 90, that kind right? of or no 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 the other one yeah yeah, yeah the other one yeah the later about. one where she, brave is that what it was yeah brave? she kind brave. of yeah she kind of it has a similar feel i think of the woman doing it, and that, that, that would be a vigilante movie, movie though. Vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember oh, being vigilante. Deathwish, but here may be a good segue into the sequel. Oh, good for you! Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, right. One thing, speaking of Dirty Harry compared to to Death Wish, one thing that Charles and the Death Wish movies didn't veer veer away from that, you know, some may argue about Dirty Harry is that you know only the first Dirty Harry movies appeared Dirty Harry movie after that. 
he became more of a liberal trying to pretend to be a conservative some would yeah. argue um not not paul kersey not paul kersey he goes the complete opposite direction motherfucker will shoot anything that moves after a bit yeah. like, but yeah. he does it he does it in a very civilized way i find I mean, oh absolutely but my he point is character wise like, he doesn't yeah. gloat he doesn't rant and rave he just well, goodbye, part you know. of what makes him so terrifying is that he just gets straight to the violence doesn't so, want to so, talk doesn't yeah. want to negotiate and then goes for a nice bang, glass of candy and you know and <laughs> but anyway, Jeff Goldblum made an appearance. There's a few people who made appearances in these movies. There's an early Jeff Goldblum in Death Wish. Um, still looking dorky like he does all the time, I guess. The uh, hat doesn't help. It doesn't. Dude, no, it really doesn't. I mean, this. And then, but it, so the ending of the movie, as we recall, I think yeah, it's the bus in Chicago. That's one of the most memorable scenes in the it's movie. It's the bus in Chicago. I get you. And he's, yeah. So well, implying, there's a Death Wish movie we never got to see. Yeah. Because they talk about him being in Chicago in the second film, don't they? Well, they, they, he moves to Chicago, and then the next thing in Death Wish 2, he's in L.A. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah, what but it's also eight movie? years later. That was yeah, kind of where yeah. his segue is. Like, we had a did, long patch in between. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but that's well, left. Referencing uh, Chicago, but they never actually show it to you. No. There was no talk of a sequel, particularly at the time, I don't think. Time passed, eight years passed, but this did leave it open because he's like, I'm not done yet. Well, he's I gotta imagine yet. there had to be some rights thing that got figured out when when Canon got on board because yeah, there there's yeah. no reason why we shouldn't have had three or four of these in the 70s. You know what I mean? Yeah. The mm -hmm. Box office wise, Bronx, it makes no sense. Bronson and Winter both thought it was done. That was their thing. Neither of them were interested in making a sequel. They figured yeah, we we told the story, we ended it where we wanted it. Yeah, they uh, figured they were going to through money at that the day. <laughs> of, you know, they told the story they wanted to tell inside of two hours, and they're kind of done with it. Like, they're off to the next thing. But, you know, I'm really glad they did come back to it because it ends in some of the best movies of all time. Yeah. So, but it did leave it open, and um, we'll talk about I think we'll move on to the canon ones um, specifically now. Um, I've got the, I'm going to play the trailers. Hope I tested them all. We should be okay for copyright. We'll see. I mean, stream shouldn't go down if it does. Jimmy Page doesn't come after you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the bit of us. I had to make sure there wasn't too much Jimmy Page. So this Death Wish 2 trailer, eh, we'll see. But I'm going to give it a go. So uh, wish me luck. Yeah, we'll start with the trailer for uh, Death Wish 2. It's MGM. Distributed by MGM. Yeah. It happened once before. Those two girls are screwed. Some yep. wife and home from I know. The they should know better than being with them. Again. And yeah. Jill yeah. Island gets away with it. The police, they've got a very good description. Well, that's why the they call the fifth one the face of death, because if you actually you see his good. face, you're going to be dead one way or the other. Yeah. Pretty much. I do love that Lawrence Fishburne is in here at like 19 years old. Oh yeah, yeah. We've, got, we've got some stills of him to show. Him. Well, as uh, Brian was pointing out, there's a lot of young actors who get a shot at you know, a role Charles as like a bad guy or what have you in one of these movies, but ended up going on to, and, you know, much more. Oh, and Cannon did a Cannon was getting shot by Charles Bronson. Yeah. <laughs> Cannon did a lot of, uh, started a lot of careers for, you, for uh, younger actors. But there's the classic scene. When you would have some... this guy who ended up going on to be in like Robocop and stuff. Yeah, yeah he was in yep. a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's, I like the fact that Jill Ireland is, is a contrast to him because she's very feminine and he's very masculine. It's a very, great couple although she obviously well, rejects him in the end austin did you talk about this at all or was this something else i was remembering where charles paid it played a huge role in what late ladies were his leads right wasn't that a big deal to him yeah yeah and so did jill actually <laughs> jill and jill and charles worked worked together on a lot of the casting i, I was gonna say wasn't that wise because they had a relationship yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I'll pause that right now because we're getting the detected on detected river, but that's a taster of it. And I do have some clips. Um, the uh, yeah, yeah, they worked of course, on about as the uh, black beanie, the signature black beanie. Yeah, they worked on about eighteen movies together, I think, in the end. So yeah, Joe um, was Joe was married to David McCallum, who mm -hmm. Charles and David McCallum were in The Great Escape together, and yeah. Charles saw saw his wife on set and is, I'm going to marry his wife and. <laughs> <laughs> and he yeah. did. But yeah. Michael Michael Winner also dated her, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back so in the a... pre 
pre-Bronson yeah. days. Incestuous, the whole thing, but yeah. Um, so lots of great artwork for Death Wish 2. Oh, yeah, the posters are iconic, no yeah. doubt. And so sufficient, sufficient so where did it get released by both? Columbia? Where you had, That's not a U.S. poster. M. 1911 in the first yeah, movie, and British then uh, F uh, Browning High Power in the second one. Yeah, this could be a European poster. Or I British think that's maybe the UK poster. Yeah. Uh, so eight years had passed, uh, and Canon uh, decided that they were going to market like they the did rights, a, yeah. a movie they didn't have a, the rights to. So how did that work, Austin? What was that? What was... Well, yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, Tr uh, Bronson and Winter both thought the idea was done and run its course, and Dino De Laurentiis also. He, he owned the sequel rights, but he didn't think anyone was going to make one. Canon, on the other hand, that was one of the first movies they announced. They were going to make a sequel to Death Wish. They bought, the Golden Globus came, bought the company, put out trade ads that they were making Death Wish 2. And they didn't have the rights. That's something usually you should check for before you take out big full-page advertisements and magazines for a movie that you actually have the rights to it. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they uh, Dino thought it was funny. He's like, nobody wants to make a Death Wish. Nobody's going to see this. Another one. So he called up. He had his lawyers call Cannon up and strong arm him into paying. I think it was 200, 200 grand for the for the sequel rights for the movie rights. <laughs> yeah. And Cannon had to. And then they wanted to get Bronson, but since they'd already advertised it, Bronson could ask whatever he wanted. So that was almost two million dollars he asked for yep. to. Yeah. star in it so that's right. <laughs> they, they, they they were in for By a lot in terms that's like two movies worth of production right? but it was free at Robinson. that time 12 12 yeah, yeah. it was yeah, free money were, for yeah, dino making movies for like yeah. you know three five dollars in a pack of cigarettes yeah. free yeah, money yeah. for dino <laughs> de laurentis movies out of franco nero for that much at that time yeah. Yeah. but yeah free money for dino de laurentis free money give me free money because yeah <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the, the joke wanted to wanted to be on, on, way, on all those guys because Canon well, made it. It works, it, and... it works out if Canon wants to make the movie and Dino has no interest in reviving the property. Well, hey, pay me pay me the license fee and then you can play with it all you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dino, um, it was free money for him, and uh, Bronson just just took a look at the size of the check, like he did for the sequ other sequels, and went, "Yeah, okay." I think Golan originally wanted to direct Austin. I think I'm right mm -hmm. in saying, but Bronson insisted on Michael Winner. Yeah, Ch Ch Charles said no, no, Menachem, you, <laughs> you're bringing Michael Winner back, or I'm not doing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course he got his wife Jill Ireland, and who is I think the only one that's ever survives these movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's the only one. She's the only one of his. I think uh, it's her. Partners, Does she survive? Partners that lives. The only one of his, yeah. the people he looked at in the films that survives. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then we also had some some great uh, actors like Vincent Gardenia. Yeah. Who had been in the first movie, so there is a a holdover. There's a connection. <laughs> um, I just love that Nick Weiser is actually driving the car. He is driving the car. Nick is driving the car. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That looks just like Nick. <laughs> Yeah. And then the the great Tony Franciosa, who I absolutely love and was in things like, I think he was in Suspiria and a lot of Italian movies like that and various mm -hmm. other things. Good actor. He's the DA. Slimy, of course. Um, and then Lawrence Fishburne. Look how He's, skinny he is, man. Now, which That's pill is he taking he is. here? Like is it the red pill or the blue like pill? It's Larry Fishburne. Get it right. He's Larry, Larry here now, I think. Tenebrae. That's the film, Elizabeth. Tenebrae. Yeah, uh, the Dario Argento horror. Um, is he taking the blue pill, the red pill, or some other pill here? Well, Looks like I'm the pink saying, pill, bro. This is before he <laughs> pink pill. Uh, was in Apocalypse Now. Uh, was it before that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought it was around, a couple years before. I thought This is 82, right? Um, yeah. I was 79, I think. Yeah. But the, okay, so yeah. He had well, done, like he had done Apocalypse Now, but that was pretty much it. It does look like the cherry sits in, in the Matrix, though. Apocalypse Now yep. was 1979, so yeah, it was yeah. three years earlier. But he does that great scene dancing on the boat to the stones. Yep. That entire movie's fucking fantastic, and yeah. you should watch it. And then, of course, the soundtrack uh, with Jimmy Page. So Jimmy Page and Michael Winner were neighbors, although their mansions were so big, it's hard to imagine they ever actually saw each other. <laughs> like, maybe waved with a telescope from the windows. Um, 
So he showed a rough cut to Jimmy Page in the movie and he said, oh, I'd, I'd love to do a soundtrack of that in some weird English accent that I can't do. <laughs> and then ended up doing two and three and Zeppelin had split by then. So you can hear Zeppelin-esque stuff in it, but he also used a lot of synths, which was, was kind of neat. So the soundtrack's pretty popular. I don't know, Tom, if you've got a copy of, of that one, but uh, it's, it's not a bad soundtrack, actually. Pretty happy that Tom's Tom's uh, dropped off this mortal. Um, uh, I yeah. think I have Death Wish two on LP, but I've not transferred it over to digital yet. Yeah. yeah. So that did actually do quite well. That soundtrack coming out of this uh, movie did sold quite well. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned Jimmy. I did not know that Robert Plant was still touring. and he's going to be here at the Municipal Auditorium. Uh, yeah, he's usually with month. Alison Krauss, isn't it? Or, yes, that's who's yeah, coming yeah, with. He yeah, does it, it's, it's his milieu now. I think he's, he's aged gracefully, which is good. He's still not trying to do immigrant song. At he doesn't Sydney. look bad. Yeah. He just, I mean, yeah, he's much older, but he doesn't look bad. Although I, I will, believe I will say I did hear uh, Diamond Head do a cover of the immigrant song that's absolutely fucking savage like two years right. ago. Mm. Uh, so that's just a few of the images. Let's show another clip or two, I think. Um, I got some stills. We'll throw some stills up while we talk about the movie a little bit. Then we'll show a couple of clips, so bear with me while I get my uh, Shiite together. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. Stills montage. Put together again at massively no expense. Um, and we can chat while these uh, clips show. So, um, yeah, the script then was, was by David Engelbach. I believe Austin, you, mm -hmm. but then heavily overwritten by Michael Winner. Yeah, the um, the the original Angleback script uh, resembled almost Death Wish three more. Um, a lot of his thing was he went out into the sort of like to this compound out in the wilderness outside outside the city and basically built himself body armor and came back with all these big weapons and things like that. And that was all removed and kind of recycled in the in the third movie, kind of the, mm. the gigantic weaponry that he had compared to what he's got here. But yeah, uh, David Engelbach wrote uh, Over the Top. <laughs> That's <laughs> Stallone, right, yeah. The Stallone mm -hmm. movie, and that was part of his deal to to get the rights to the Over the Top script. Canon gave him the gig to write Death Wish 2. Had they not passed him over for that, and then in order for him to, to he wanted to revive that idea with him, that was the deal that they had to make that if he wrote this. Because they'd already said no to that. Yeah, well, they, he ended up also making a movie called America Three Thousand with them, which oh, is that's a, a great movie. <laughs> yeah, the movie. wild, wild, fun um, post-apocalyptic post comedy. Um, women are dominant type thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a reverse gore, but yeah, it's 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 funny. It's worth checking yeah. out. <laughs> so this uh, the action has moved to LA, Chicago, where he ends up at the end of the first movie. Never appears in any of the movies. No, nope. it moves to LA and then it moves back. To, he moves back to Brooklyn in the third one, I think, and then he goes back to LA again. Um, he clearly had a transatlantic ticket deal with Pan and American or whoever was in there, <laughs> or trans uh, uh, continental. Yeah, yep, only five um, first class. That's what they were saying. First class. <laughs> And then Larry Fishburne and co. make the fatal mistake of well, he annoys these guys with it. They've got the whole wallet stealing scene at the beginning, and then they go in and uh, I had to cut a lot of stuff out of these stills because of things. Oh, I'm sure. Do. there's. I'm sure there's boobs everywhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, there is. Oh, yeah. It's just, well, this one's in 82, but it, it's kind of a carryover from the 70s. They weren't afraid yeah. of nudity back then. They weren't afraid of that at all. They, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, and, and this is where Michael Winner's directing again uh, caught a lot of criticism because he, he has that, that house invasion scene it's at least what six seven minutes worth mm -hmm. of great and depending on where you and, see it but yeah yeah uh pretty heavy stuff and then of course his daughter gets kidnapped jumps out the window and there's that famous um impalement scene which i when i saw it in the cinema because i was old enough to go and see it in the cinema that actually did make me jump out of my seat mm -hmm. like it was oh my god that's pretty yeah. gruesome you know so winner seems to like the the sadistic stuff. Um, so this is a dark movie. Yeah. 
And, no, and like we were talking about earlier, that uh, you know, uh, once again, it's 82, but it's a carryover from the 70s, and it was a dark time, man. I mean, th the big movies at the time, like uh, I remember uh, one thing, one of the things me and my brother watched over and over again was the car chase underneath the uh, elevated train in French Connection. We watched that over and over again, man. And that's yeah. a dark flick, too, and it's a true story. I mean, Serpico, there was tons of Dog Day Afternoon. The entire decade was just dark stuff. Yeah, really I, and I the bit I like about it though is the fact that they take these street scenes and I believe Winner did film on the streets, the actual streets, mm -hmm. a lot of actual people, not extras. It does look rough as hell. Yep, it's an urban wasteland, and this mm -hmm. is supposedly in the Sunshine State, you know. So it's and looks for those real... of you who have never been there, uh, LA still kind of looks like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really gritty looking, really dark looking, and it's full of scuzz balls. Uh, and so he does the whole renting a shitty room in a shitty area, gets the cap on, gets the weapons together, starts hunting down these guys. Uh, very dark. The other yeah. ones, later ones got a little bit lighter, and more kind of action, car not cartoony, but more action oriented. This is a they become eighties awesome. movies uh, later yeah. on. He, then, he's using Laws rockets and and M two hundred three grenade launchers, yeah. and you and know that's the there's the the <laughs> whole Jesus scene, which mm -hmm. I, I do have yeah, the clips. Which, which of. apparently Hollywood doesn't understand how the M two hundred three works. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that clip he showed earlier in the month. I was just like, really. Yeah. <laughs> They don't or know how fire, a rocket firing at a target either. like three feet away from it. it's like ah, uh, mm -mm. <laughs> like as someone who's used that real in real life. Yeah, no. you don't want to do that. Well, He's I mean, lucky he hit him work. with it. <laughs> so, well, no, it just won't work. It so, just yeah, won't no. <laughs> For those who've watched both movies, Death Wish one and two, and I guess Austin and Tom, you may have seen both many times, and excluding the rest of you guys, but. Do you feel there's a difference, Austin, in the two in any way, or are they almost like the same movie? They're very similar, and I think that was the concern that Winner, Bronson, and De Laurentiis all had, is that how can we do it without doing the same thing again? And the answer is we don't. We just do the same thing again, and people will be happy to <laughs> see more of it, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, this and, time we also have to remember that video wasn't quite a thing yet. No. Um, mm -hmm. seeing a movie on television, would you be lucky to catch a you know on a, on a broadcast once in a while and stuff like that? So even seeing a movie like this, I mean, this is why a lot of those times when you see early late seventies and early eighties movies, they will have all new on the poster because they would re-release movies so much in theaters that they had to let people know that this is not the same movie you watched you know three months ago here, you know. This is a new one. Yeah, the, the the first I think the first Canon show we did, Tom, we were talking about the second run theaters where you could pay yeah. a buck to go see a flick. And but back uh, in the day, they just used to be standard, right? Like it yeah, was just, absolutely. Um, like you would go but, every weekend. You'd go see a new movie, but also at the same time, they would have a re-release of whatever, mm -hmm. like Death Wish and Dirty Harry, like mm -hmm. we mentioned before. You know, absolutely. Yeah. And the VHS was around, guys. I mean, yeah, they, uh, they, they I, came out in the seventies. It was, but yeah. it didn't but really it take was over not, until like the eighties. Yeah. Like, the the yeah. tapes were very yeah. expensive. Yeah. You just rented them at the time, and you recorded your own HBO stuff. was new at this point did. too. Yeah. Um, My dad bought his first v, uh, uh, VCR in nineteen eighty one for fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, exactly. And it was one yeah. of the old top loaders with a wired yep. remote. Now, do the inflation on that? Yeah, right, it would be like mm. five grand now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Gardenia so, is playing Ocha again, uh, uh, the cult that. Trailed him in the first film. Looks and like he got of... some screenshots from the new scan. Sorry, <laughs> looks good. <laughs> These are pretty good. Yeah, I have. Yeah, uh, that new 4K from uh, Vinegar Syndrome looks amazing. Sorry. Yeah, I've, I've got a that. few more recent copies of these uh, digitally. I don't have the physical ones, unfortunately, but uh, the um, yeah, they look pretty good. And and so the cop is. Funny though, speaking them. of VHS, this was one of my first VHS. Go ahead. Yeah, so continue, I. My bad. I saw it at the cinema, but I also rented it about a year later on VHS. <laughs> so. But I told that story, I think, on the first Canon show, which is, yeah, so yeah. go back, refer to that, but yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a very compressed set of images, as a, you know, we've only got a limited time and in one show to do multiple movies, but I really do think that, that it shows the darkness of, everyone thinks of the Sunshine State, it shows that CD underbelly very well of LA, that the cops are trailing them, 
he's trailing the gang, and as you know, you just know that the Gardenia's character is end up going to end up siding with them in a way because <laughs> they always do. Um, it, uh, well, I've always loved that about uh, Bronson's character in these movies is that like the cops are either on the take and therefore on the side of the bad guys, or they end up like kind of so, like looking the other way while he does his thing. Yeah, because they're just looking at it like, well, he's not wrong. Yeah, this is the stuff where he's trailing them on the bus. I really like these scenes in the movie where he's following them on the bus. Uh, there's a lot of atmosphere, a lot of tension, a lot yeah. of atmosphere. Um, I don't. Um, I, it's unfortunate we can't play the music because some of these scenes with the music in them are just just wonderful. Uh, we, we'd be struck within an inch of our lives immediately. Mm-hmm. So he's at, he's at the park, and I think this is where someone's trying to snipe him. And the I can't remember who it is. There's a guy trying to shoot Kersey, but this the cop Gardenia's cop warns him, and then of course suffers the death wish consequence of helping Kersey, oh, or or even looking at Paul Kersey, <laughs> even being was, in the same yeah. state as Paul. Yeah. Shouldn't you be within the vicinity of him at all? Think about him. That's right. Yeah. Don't even don't even think about him. Yeah, it's too late. I thought about him. It's like uh, right. uh, the Ghostbusters. Never, never. Don't. It's too late. Stay puffed, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, um, is it the main villain Nirvana? Well, the last remaining one of the gang, Nirvana, is captured before Kersey can get him, and then pleads insanity and goes to the mental hospital so we're gonna get to that stuff yeah. and of course he then has to indul- infiltrate all that and uh, that's yeah. that's a bit i do like where he doesn't just blast he doesn't just charge in there with guns blazing shoot all the staff and kill the guy no he just thinks this that's one thing i like about the entire movie in general is that he always does things the smart way yeah he He's doesn't not do what you know stallone or schwarzenegger would do and just kick in the door and start shooting yeah uh, revenge is a dish Best served cold. Yes, I am doomed, D Bud. I'm very much doomed. Um, in fact, I might even have a, a video for that. We're doomed. <laughs> and sadly, I do have to go. I wish I had, didn't because uh, I love the Death Wish films. Uh, uh, no we need to revisit them again soon. Uh, but uh, take care, guys, and hopefully I can. Uh, Bye, Tom. Yeah, thanks for being night, here, Tom, Tom, buddy. We'll see you later, mate. Take, take care. care. Always good to see you, man. Bye. Um, yeah, so yeah, I like the I like the whole fact that he, he's he's not a hothead. I mean, I guess it's similar to to, to um, Dirty Harry and some other Clint characters. You don't want a guy that's just a ra- raving, frothing, going after people. And he thinks about it. Revenge is a dish best served cold. He plans it. He follows people. He he knows what he's doing. He doesn't. And he's an architect, I guess. He's a smart guy. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I have always loved about Bronson's character in these is he's going after the exact people he wants to go after. Like it's not just oh I'm gonna say oh I'm just gonna go clean up the streets and every criminal he sees just gets whacked. Yeah, I like this interesting question from Nesmer. Nesmister, Nesmer. Uh, On that note, Nesmer. Nesmer, uh, you like the, oh, no, the approach to situations with smarts? Do you like that that comparison of No Country for Old Men versus BBC Sherlock? Well, um, I mean, yeah. No Country for Old Men is a is a methodical. Like Tommy Lee, his cop is a methodical guy. Um, so is um, uh, the the main villain. Uh, whose name yeah, I think, that's right a good, I think that's a Some that old. makes a good character is that they show that they're thinking about things and actually doing things the smart way. Well, it makes him scarier too, mm-hmm. well, especially the, the bad it's guys. Idiot. I mean, it's, it's like a it's like a horror movie for the bad guys. You know yeah, what I'm saying? The idiot can just open fire, but yeah. a smart man will just sit there and hunt you. Yeah, it's and it's one of the things I've loved about Bronson in all five movies. It, like the end of the first one with the finger, with the finger, like perfect. Mm-hmm. Just yeah, I'm gonna thank, get one day. Thank you for uh, subscribing to the channel, Insufferable, Insufferable Bastards Podcast. I must check you out because that's a great name. Um, it is a great name. 
It is awesome. What's a monkey Bronson would have had to fight an alligator and a guy on bath salts in Death Wish, Florida, man. That's actually a great <laughs> concept. I do like that Roman Roman buddy. That's a great one. I do and like that. Nasner's also not wrong that you know BBC Sherlock was written by idiots who think smart people are wizards. That's right, yes, yes. But um, uh, out of all the anti-heroes coming out of this period, he was probably the scariest one out of all of them. Because mm -hmm. the lengths he was willing to go to. You know what I mean? Well, well dirty, ha you, dirty, ha dirty Harry, so scary. Dirty Harry was still that he would go to any law. lengths. Dirty Harry was outside, still a cult, uh, inside or outside the law, to get what he wanted. Because usually, your head on a pike. Yeah, he um, had principles, though. Uh, yes, you must not have seen Magnum Force. There was things he was not going to do. Uh, this is where Jill, Jill Ireland gets the get out of jail free card, of the course. get out of cursy free card, and uh, yeah. The only one to ever leave. <laughs> yeah, he must have said, in this script, I want Jill, my wife, to live. So we got to, uh, yeah. got to leave, yes. Yeah, and it... <laughs> uh, but I love the fact he gets into the... the um, he gets into the mental hospital, has the fight with the guy, and then electrocutes him. Mm -hmm. Hair-raising. He gets the electric chair one way or another. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, yeah. I love that I'm, image. Of I love the, that Bronson's he gets fucked shadow. up with that scalpel pretty bad. So, John, yeah, go ahead. John. I love that image with Bronson's shadow on on the advertisement. Oh it's like, yeah. You know, it's it's not done. <laughs> it's not done. And, yes. And that scene is gruesome as hell when you look at how many times he gets stabbed. So, with your indulgence, yeah, he does get stabbed quite a few times. I mean, Kelsey's not superhuman. He's not superhuman. No, he gets, he, he gets beaten he, up. He's pretty hurt. Because yeah, as you would expect from a guy who's an architect, he's not a great fighter, in, in per se. I mean, he's a big guy, but he's not trained in fighting that much. He's, he's, he could he's, be a Green Lantern, no doubt. Some of the yeah. stuff he just do, does through pure will. Yeah, so one of the you know? scenes we, we all love in this movie is the, the come to Jesus scene or go to Jesus scene. Mm -hmm. So let's have a little look oh, at I, I, it. It's still one of my favorite lines in all you, Hollywood history. And you out, not you. Sorry about the logo over the top, but I was trying Gotta to. Gotta have it. Out. Gotta have yeah. it. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, I didn't get the opacity right, but I'll work on that in future shows. Yep. You believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Well, you're going to meet him. <laughs> uh, one of the classics. Yes, sir. One of the greatest lines of all time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, somebody was asking about director's cuts. Austin, I don't know if you're aware of any specific ones. There are uh, many, many cuts of Death Wish 2. Um mm. And you actually have to, to see all of it, you have to watch each of them because they have scenes. Even the TV cut, which is something that's crazy to think about, they cut Death Wish 2 for basic cable back in the in the late 80s. But that has extra scenes in it. So I I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, somebody some, somewhere someday will actually take like the theatrical, the unrated, and the um, TV cut and sort of piece them together. And they did that a lot cut. with... They did that a lot with uh, uh, those movies uh, back in the day when they put them on uh, regular, you know, free broadcasting stations. Like the first time I saw, what was it? <laughs> Superman the movie uh, on ABC. There was an entire thing where, you know, where he drills down into the sewers mm -hmm. and then he pushes in Lex Luger's door or Luther's door. Well, there's a whole sequence there where he walks through fire. He walks through ice. You know, he gets frozen and busts out of it and he's, walks through a uh, hail of gunfire and then he pushes in the door. It's a bunch of tests Lex has for him. And it wasn't in the original movie. I thought it was, I yeah. thought it was great. You know, occasionally the yeah. TV cuts are actually better because yes. they've, got scenes that are not in. they've got stuff. They've that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I think they, this oh. movie, Austin, I think you're, they cut a lot out of the theatrical one, which explained his relationship with the police after his daughter gets um, killed. I think they cut a lot of that out because he's mm -hmm. he's completely unwilling to tell the police anything about it. But it has scenes that help explain that a bit more. And it seems like the police know who he is mm -hmm. and what he's do. done. 
and are basically willing to leave, you know, basically let sleeping dogs lie. Yeah, mm. but yeah I think there's a lot of extra material. That, the very next movie that Bronson did with Canon uh, after this was Ten to Midnight, which has mm-hmm. some similar themes to to this good one. Movie. But they That's actually the whole the whole gimmick is the bad guy in that one strips down naked and likes to kill people when he's nude, and so they'd have a TV cut. They actually Gene Davis had to film every scene. Mm. It, one version where he's nude, and then they had to go back and do it, shoot multiple takes, and get all the angles again where he was wearing like a little wow. black. Wow, so that pulp, would have been a headache for me. You weren't the star yeah. of that pulp, were you? It sounds like a movie you starred in. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, uh, these days they would have just pixelated it, you know, right? but they couldn't do that back then. Yeah, yeah. no, in, indeed, that's um, that would have been a curious movie, I guess. Um, yeah, like. The, the cuts are largely the same. It's just one version with underwear and yeah. one without. <laughs> so one was the one was the the non-cultural version, and the other was the cultural version. I believe Ken that the balance shall t- tip in the favor of culture. Anyone that can name that movie gets a special prize. That's the banshees of Inisherin and those guys make great movies. Well, that's not that movie, but anyway. Um, ah. Yeah. So I think we'll just we'll play another before we move on to Death Wish three. Um, I do have another couple of clips from Death Wish two. Uh, this is the oh yeah, this is the hair raising scene. So let's have a look at that. Oh, nice. What is that? What is that? It's got blood egg pouring out of him. Like the point see, Pope, you, your hair can do that. <laughs> I mean, because if you think about it, a scalpel's fucking sharp. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's just yeah. going to go right in until it hits bone. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons surgeons use them is they're really good at cutting specifically what you want. Mm. And they'll cut through almost anything. But I did like the the fact that he, he isn't invulnerable. You know, he's, no. he's a smart yeah. guy, but he's not yeah. invulnerable. That's one of the best things about Death Wish as a series is, you know, you see him get messed up pretty bad a couple of times. It's not like most Stallone or Schwarzenegger movies where, you know, he just seems to shrug off bullet wounds and or, you know, burns like it's fine. Where, you know, Kersey gets messed up pretty bad on a couple of occasions and barely survives it. Yep. Uh, I've got one more clip and then we'll move on to Dash. Uh, Dash Austin, you're you're muted, buddy. You're muted. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were talking to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I would say the, one of the things logically that shows the logical leap from the first and second movies to the third ones is you see him get beat up and t- you know really screwed up at the end of the second movie but the first thing you see him do in the in the third movie is he's in prison and he just like kicks a dude's ass with like hand to hand fighting it's much bigger oh yeah than that's right the prison stuff yeah he's mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's funny because he does appear to gain some skills in that area although you never see him training with for those skills one minute he's a mild yeah. mannered architect the next minute he's a Boxer, and I guess Look, at this point, see. he's just Charles Bronson. He's just Charles Bronson. <laughs> okay, he's well, Charles Bronson. So, a final video clip, I think, from two before we move on. Uh, let me just tee this one up. This would be the this is the goodbye scene. So, another one of his, I've got you now, you're done. <laughs> Which I thought it's very polite of him to say goodbye like that. Yeah. Don't you yeah. think? You know, yeah. he's cordial. It's kind of polite. Yeah. Kind of polite, you know. Yeah, um, he's, he's got manners. Yeah. He's got good manners. Right. So, Death Wish 2, any final thoughts before we move on to 3? I don't think that any other star can be as menacing just walking forward as Charles Bronson. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah, in the Jesus scene, he walks forward, yeah. walks forward, walks forward. Yeah. 
Yeah, people would ask He's him the Mike that. Myers oh. of action oh. stars. So go ahead, Austin. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, a lot of people would ask him about that during the Death Wish like press tours for these sequels, and he's he would always say, "He's Bron- Bronson would say it's not my fault people get out of the way when I'm walking down the sidewalk." He's like, "I'm a friendly <laughs> guy." <laughs> I, don't, I just don't get it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, me, but it was a big hit. So Death Wish oh. Two was a big hit. Made what's fifty million dollars on an eight million dollar mm-hmm. budget. You have to admit though. Charles Bronson does have resting menace face, though. Yeah, I mean, he really just does. looks like he'd kick your ass just by looking at you. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. So, so, he the, wasn't he the complete opposite of that? Like a genuinely nice guy? He right. yeah. really was yeah. a nice, mild mannered guy <laughs> who was worried a little bit about the violence, although it didn't seem to stop him. I guess five million bucks or whatever we ended up getting in the end was. Yeah. The I'll money. swallow. I'd swallow my principles for that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to get paid a lot less to swallow my principles, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> at, so, at this point in Bronson's career, this was his retirement. Like, if Cannon wanted to pay him millions of dollars to make one movie that was, you know, he had to play a vigilante or a, you know, a cop that doesn't play by the rules, he would leave his horse ranch in Vermont to go. To go do it for like three. That's one thing I've always loved about Bronson and makes him unique among the action stars is how old he was when he was really coming into his own as an action star. Yeah. Is like, like you say, he was in his late 50s. Yeah. You know who's like that today? Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much the same. He kind of has the same mentality, the same look about him too, of just this big looming monstrosity of a man Mm -hmm. that. It's just very intimidating. Like the take. He's been and forward. Liam Neeson's a guy that's been around Hollywood forever. He's been in a bunch of movies, you know that you you know and love. And uh, he just was never the leading guy until Taken was made, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, first, also the Gray. Yeah, the Gray was the absolutely Gray's a, best role that's a all, good movie. Know. Yeah, the Gray's mm-hmm. a good movie. A couple, couple uh, of his first roles were canon movies. Really, he was in, uh, duet for one. He. Uh, Oh the, yeah, that's uh, right. The garbage man who banged uh, Julie Andrews, and oh, that's uh, right. yeah, he was one of the Delta Force. Like he's like one of the guys like in the background mm. of the Delta Force. Oh, you're Force, right. Like, yeah, that was and in. How, uh, yeah. uh, I watched that movie. I just Steve James is Delta Force movie. Uh, but how many like, people can say they've banged Julie Andrews? I mean, come on, right? <laughs> come on, man. Not many. <laughs> and and of course he did not just canon. I mean, he, he's some of his early. He was in the early oh, uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, Dirty, the Deadpool. He was in the Deadpool and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that. Well, man, he's uh, my favorite movie he's ever been in. He uh, is Excalibur. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's yeah. he's he's the knight. I can't remember the knight's name, but he's the one that calls out the love affair between Guinevere and uh, Lancelot. I believe that's you know Galahad. that's him. He, he's he's the one that has to fight Lancelot. He's you know. Uh, uh, Knight, uh, his name is Sir Cut Your Arm Off. Right? <laughs> he was Cut also your nose off crawl. to spite your face. That's it. Yeah, he's in Crawl, too. I remember right. that one. Yeah, yeah. We, could do a, we could do an entire, entire show on, on Liam And Neeson, we probably but will. Same and he was Rob Roy, and he played Rob Roy, which was yep. a, weird because he was Scottish, not Irish. But, you mm-hmm. know. Um, Death Wish 3, so the success of 2 made it inevitable. There would be a three, I think, with increasing money going to Bronson. Uh, I think what 1985 was Death Wish three, so you mm-hmm. know, three years between the two. Um, this time, uh, still directed by Michael Winner, but with a script by Don Jacoby. Austin, I think that's the right. guy's name. Yeah, I was going to bring this up. Uh, they came out with a video game for this movie. That's the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never was, played it. Was, it's a side scroller shoot shooting game. Yeah. Wow! You just you just mow down just waves and waves of bad guys with like <laughs> missile launchers and machine guns and hand so, cannons. And, so you're saying it's good? What yeah, I'm hearing is it was. It's good. Oh, it's it's from Commodore 64. I've played this game. It's amazing. Yeah, if, it, if anybody yeah. wants to play it, it's up on archive.org. You can play it free in your browser. Uh, yeah, you can download it, it for free. free. Yeah. You are Bronson. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's well, on I mean, fire crazy. in the background. The Everything in the background is on fire. Movies, <laughs> is you get to be Charles Bronson for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I love this image. I mean, we've used it for the backdrop for the show today. It's, I don't know who created it, and forgive me for taking it, whoever did, but it's a beautiful image. Once again, resting menace face. Okay, so, uh, 
And it he's even got a touch of sweat on him here. You know, he's just breaking sweat. I didn't sweat. know this until I actually just looked it up right now. But Wildy is actually apparently Charles Bronson's personal sidearm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, he just bought it and then put so it in the movies. So we're going to get to that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the Jacoby who had written Life Force and Invaders of Mars, or was going to write Invaders of Mars, I think, after this, um, he wrote the script, but Michael Winner again heavily overwrote it. I think to the point that Jacoby got his name, Austin, he got his name taken off for. Yeah, he's Michael Edmonds in the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was so <laughs> disgusted color. with with Winner's basically rewriting his entire screenplay that he said, well, oh, fuck this shit. So, um, but Jacoby was also going to do a version, right? Pinocchio, is that right? Can yeah, he was he was attached to the uh Toby Hooper movie. Toby Hooper, whatever yeah. happened to that and just ran out of cash, I guess, or uh, you're roboting a little breaking bit. Breaking up there, Sorry. big daddy. You're breaking roboting, up. you're doing the robot. Uh yeah, I want to hear more about the Pinocchio when you, you oh, are you back? You're back. I yeah, sorry, I Yeah, you're still, yeah, a, bit you're still a little bit, but yeah, I'll give you a minute to, to get back. Yeah, um, because it's a whole canon, the movies canon didn't make, it was interesting the ones they did. So, mm-hmm. Kersey expands his, his revenge in this to more of a general cleanup in the streets. There's, there's specific things where he kills people he doesn't like, but generally, he's cleaning up the block here in three and well, it's, uh, in this one, they, he is going after the people who killed his friend. So, oh, yeah. but then he kind of winds it out into oh, Austin's back. Sorry, yeah, hang on, we'll get him in there. and uh, it's back in Brooklyn. This one, so he's going from LA to Brooklyn, uh, coast to coast. Coast to coast. Hey, Austin, can you hear me now? We can, yes, sir. Okay, Where if I... are you? Oh, there you are. Yep, Maybe yeah, the can... Pinocchio thing. What happened with that? That movie. So, yeah, it was going to star Lee Marvin as Geppetto. It was going to be a science fiction. Pinocchio was going to be a robot in it. Toby Hooper was going to direct. But uh, the, the relationship with Toby Hooper just ran its ran its course. It, it went very yeah. poorly after Chainsaw 2. Um, so it just never never came to be. And plus, Lee, Lee Marvin got sick and died like real quick yeah. after Delta Force. Exactly, yeah. Uh, was so, Delta yeah. Force the last movie he made? Uh, I believe so. His last theatrical feature, at least. I would like to have seen Tobe Hooper's Pinocchio Chainsaw 3. I think that would have been... <laughs> oh, my God. The matchsticks. I, I just wanted to see Charles Bronson <laughs> and Lee Marvin on the same screen one last time. I know, I know. The Dirty it's Dozen the stu- was just such an amazing movie. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, stuff that, awesome. the stuff that Canon didn't make was as interesting as the stuff they did make sometimes. They really tried to make a lot of stuff. Uh, so in some of the people in this movie are Alex Winter. Right there, Bill and Ted. Mm-hmm. I was fixing to say, I thought I recognized him. He's in the Lost Boys, too. Yeah, so Alex Winter yeah. has a role as one of the gang members in this. Wow. I can't remember his name. I, I, um, I saw that. I, I thought that when I was watching this, mo- this movie again, uh, Friday night, I'm like, wait a minute, that's Ted. I thought yeah. I recognized him. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's totally Ted. Totally, yeah, totally. Um, Ted. And isn't that and then Ed Lo- is not the actor that plays Dad? Indeed. Ed Lauter, who's a veteran of, or was a veteran of like, multiple TV shows, he was always a cop. Yeah. He's always, he's always a cop, but he's also kind of a dick in everything he's in. Yeah, he's always a dick and always a cop, but he was great in this. You know, mm-hmm. you just know in the end he's going to be on Bronson's side eventually. <laughs> well, they're either on Bronson's side or they end up dead. So Exactly. You know. Or both. Or um, both. Uh <laughs> Kirk Taylor, who's Giggler. This is the film where they had lots of the great names like Giggler and Cutter and uh, you name it. You know, the, the names were good. I'm just trying to find a, a list of them here. Um, I mean, let's face it, Razor's been using that on his live streams for the last at least 10 years. Of, they killed yeah. the Giggler! Giggler, that's right. So Giggler, the Cuban. There's another one. Angel. I, I believe he's in Full yeah. Metal Jacket as well. Yeah, uh, Austin, I th- think you've probably got a handle on some of the movies this guy's in. Yeah, Full Metal Jacket's correct. 
That's the yeah. biggest one. I just talked. I, I just talked about that movie last night. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's had some other run. stuff, but that's definitely one of them. Yeah, um, Martin Balsam, who another veteran of like dozens and dozens of movies, like Twelve Angry Men, is the one that always sticks in my mind. Uh, must have been getting near the end of his career in this one, but had been in so much great stuff. So that is a bit of gravitas when you get a guy like this. Good bit of casting, you know. Yeah, the movie I, you're going to laugh at me. The movie I remember this guy for the most. And it's because just simply because I've seen it the most um, was a movie called Saint Elmo's Fire. He had a oh, small Saint, part Saint as Fire. the father of the blonde that was a social worker in that movie. Yeah, and uh, was trying to give her money to you know uh, typical to, get, get in business for herself and stuff. And yeah, very much an eighties kind of teenish mm -hmm. movie. Uh, Saint Elmo's Fire. I think it, 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 they called him the Brat Pack. It was the Brat ones Pack. from yeah. Okay. It was it was yeah. Demi Moore and, and was the uh, song Judd from Nelson. The, was the song Saint Elmo's Fire in that? that Saint Elmo's Fire was from John that from John Parr. John yeah. Parr, sorry, yes, mm -hmm. John Parr. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, Stephen Ransom. Well, uh, thanks for being here, Stephen. We did have a picture of Jeff Goldblum early, looking particularly goofy in Death Wish One. True. And I yeah, wish I, had, I wish I had this guy's you know rifle collection because this man has an MG forty two in his closet. He does. He's this and man 19, is, is fully armed and ready to go. He's just waiting for Cursey to And turn the up. best part is as much as shit as I give a lot of Hollywood movies, they actually had the correct belts for both weapons. Yes. So is that who this, I think it is name, on the left? Name that yes. woman. <laughs> uh I don't remember her name, but she's Marina, on Next Generation, right? Marina Sirtis. Yes. Okay. I think again, Austin, she might have been in other canon things. I'm not sure. Yeah, she was in other uh, Michael Winner movies oh, they dated Winner. for a while. This is why I love revisiting these old movies to see who you know who the young up and comers yeah. were at the time that we know and love now for other things, you know. Yeah, yeah she very has the, cool. those of you who always wanted to see Cal Counselor Troy's boobs, there they are. There they are. <laughs> Bam. Yes, she, she has some. a naked whip fight with uh Fade Dunaway and, and mm -hmm. the Wicked Lady. Oh, the Wicked Lady, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, I knew it was a yep. canon movie. Is that a canon Wicked Lady mm -hmm. or is it mm -hmm. just a winner? Yeah, that, Mike uh, Winner and Canon teaming Mike, up. Uh, Michael Winner's excuse to make another movie full of naked women fighting each other, which is just rock and God roll. Bless the man for it. So this this is the setting. I love again. I do love the settings they've used in real streets with real garbage, and this is Brooklyn, supposedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may yep. have been on a set, but it looks like yeah, it's this, real. This shot is East New York, yeah, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It just looks like what it's meant to be—a desolate urban wasteland. With a handful of good people scrabbling to survive amongst a, a bunch of assholes, and it could be just it's dystopian, Which, you know. That's that's just New York, in a nutshell. Yeah. Oh, look at this! Oh, oh my God! Okay. Oh, like oh, I said, oh. one how of, beautiful is that? That's apparently a pope, yeah, in the movie ahead. because it's Charles Bronson's personal sidearm. Yeah. Wow. So uh, tell us about like this he has one. A six inch barrel on it. Which means it weighs a little over five pounds. Yeah. So like this good. thing is just a, it's basically a 1911 that's been built out to support Magnum cartridges. 475. Yeah. Wow. In this case, 475, but apparently the Wilder Magnum was also available in 44 and a whole bunch of other cartridges. Right. Uh, Do they still make these? Right. No, they don't. Um, no. The company, I believe, went under in 2011. Um, I'm shocked that made they made a handgun that size. That's wow. That's so, well, so I've never, I've never fired one of these. Bag, other than right. IMI Oop. has stopped making it eventually because the guns just beat themselves to death. Apparently, uh, over did time. you say you'd fired one, Austin? I've, I've never fired one of these, but I've I've held one. Bob Savakinis, who's one of the bigger biggest Bronson fans I know, owns owns one, and just holding the damn thing is exhausting. She's a big girl for a yeah. pistol. And isn't like, the ammunition I mean, more it, for rifle? It's only, rifle ammunition, really. Hunting well, rifle. I mean, well, yeah. It, it's bigger caliber than most rifles and has more powder behind it than most rifles. I and mean, God, look at the size of that boar. Good Lord. <laughs> and wow. it was his own that's weapon. Huge. Yeah, it, it's a 47 caliber. Oh, that's crazy. It's 0.475. It's a damn near 480. Mm. And people already think 45 ACP is a big, a big cartridge. This thing is a 45 ACP wider 
with way more powder behind it. That's and it's semi-automatic too. Or Good lord, that is. And it's crazy. got an eight-round magazine too. So one of my one of my favorite images when I want to think of Bronson in his old age, basically retirement in the '90s, like after he'd st- after Death Wish Five. He used to ride around on a motorcycle on his, he had this big sprawling horse ranch in Vermont. Hmm. And with this, basically this weapon, like in a holster at his waist and a machete strapped to the handlebars. <laughs> and if that's, <laughs> that's how I love to like think of Charles Bronson. Was he topless as well? Was he topless, <laughs> shirtless? I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I would have just looked at that and just gone, like that is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It that's is, that's life gold right there. So, that um, gun would cut you in half if, if he hit you with it. Good lord! Well, that's you would see it, a fairly re- a fair representation of what that thing will do to you in the yeah. movie, where it basically just takes the center out of most people. Oof. So we're gonna just take a quick look at the trailer. Uh, hopefully, we'll get away with it. We tried the last one; I had to stop it a little earlier. But we're, we'll do this. Is this is the official trailer? Are some problems with that heavy base, yes. New York, a city pushed to the edge, people pushed to the limit, and no one's got the guts to stop them. It's collection time, Charlie. Three murders, yeah. four rapes, nine acts of random violence. Does it a neighbor who didn't think that war. you know New York was always a shit? There is one way, one man who won't be pushed. Oh, it's been pretty Charles bad. Runs yeah. What's the problem? Mm-hmm. Now you're going to die. Well, that car, I've got that clip of the car thing. That's hilarious. We're going to play that. <laughs> People have got to start to fight back and hard. I sent them a message. That's him. I'll take care of him. The reverse now, mohawk. He's in the middle of a war. Oh, my God. The ma- so ah, the done. Mac 10. When you want to hit yeah, everything man. except for the <laughs> In a world gone mad, there is only one law. His. Charles Bronson. God, I miss movie trailers that were like this. Wow! The ones that sound like this in the world. Yeah, just just not even like the audio, but just everything. Yeah. Just Charles Bronson manhandling a freaking M1919. Bringing justice to the streets. Yeah, we've got that scene too, so don't worry. Wish three. <laughs> I mean, Wasn't that a 50 reality, caliber machine gun that built fed room? Oh, wasn't that a 50 caliber machine gun, man? No, it's a 30 uh, cal. Um, oh, okay. but well, the, problem, let's... Like, the problem is that's an air-cooled barrel. So what he's oh, oh, and he's got his hand on it. That's what I thought. You're I was like, yeah. living shit out of yourself. Well, wait a minute. I think I think we really need <laughs> to check the 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 machine gun uh, stuff that we're talking about here. So let's just uh, let's have a little look. Just there, just in a wooden, ca- you know, cabinet yep. in the side yeah. room, you know. Yeah. Not so even locked up. That is actually a cloth belt for 1919. Wow. <laughs> that, wow. That is the correct. They came in 250 round belts. And uh, like modern hundred rounders. That's. I mean, we do need to see it in action as well. I think. Do what you think? Yes. We, we should sure. see it. See it in action. Sure. <laughs> But that, that grip is what I'm saying. You would not have skin on it. No. Inside of his hand. After about 20 <laughs> rounds. That would hurt. The heat. The heat. Yeah. The heat. So, and yes. For the, and for those of you who don't know my background, I was a Marine machine gunner for four years. That shit will burn the entire skin off but of your Pope, hand. On the other hand, Pope, you're spoiling all the fun. <laughs> well, I know. But it's, it, it's, it, it's funny for me because. That's my like, job, fucker. We're not. We're not watching this for, <laughs> for veracity. We're watching this for the people well, getting blown fun, it's away. It's fun for me to be the wet blanket for it. I suppose. Oh, yeah. He'd be hurt right now. Box beside him. <laughs> and there is actually a Marine who earned a Medal of Honor for doing exactly what Bronson's doing right here. His name was John yeah. Basilow. So, and, so what uh, we're... look up that man's story. Jesus Christ. He it's actually did this and was severely yeah. injured, but won the Medal of Honor for it. But I think the point is that he's upped his armament in this movie. Just yeah. a little. A little bit. Just a little. Yeah. Like, but but he, went, he went from like a Browning high power to Wildy and then a 1919 
and uh, his friend had an MG42. Yeah, again, I gotta get the. Uh, they the didn't details. scale back the Let's armaments. They definitely amped them up every movie, no doubt. Yeah, he's up to armament. He's now taking on entire city blocks full of gangs. Um, he's back in New York. He's in Brooklyn as opposed to Manhattan. But well, hey, what's the difference? Well, I know well, he difference. stayed there before, you know, and he yeah. knows how bad it is. So he uh, he he put all his guns on steroids. That's what. So he he's did. he's yeah. basically the death of his friend prompts him to not only get revenge on that gang, but also to just do a general cleanup of the streets in that area because the poor long-suffering people in that one building apparently it's all in one building mainly are all really I, lo off. I love the uh board trap he has where it basically as soon as it goes off it's like oh yeah what are those things like those are someone's teeth <laughs> or the nails <laughs> yeah Nothing fancy think... just nails through a board putting it right under a window you're gonna come in through my window you're yeah. gonna have a bad time it's i young. think Ascension dildo has a point, Pope. It will burn the skin of mere mortals like that. Is you. very true. Bronson not is Bronson. not a man. Bronson is not. He, this is a man who mined coal <laughs> age ten. Jeez. Oh man. <laughs> have man you, have you guys, have Sorry, you guys covered uh, missing in action three yet? Oh, not yet. We're we we're saving a, Chuck for. Uh, I, I, I need to watch that movie and get Pope's commentary because yeah. he has a. Charles uh, Chuck Norris has a machine gun with an attached grenade launcher and a retractable bayonet. Yeah. In it. It's just the most magical gun I've ever Does seen. Does he have a plasma rifle? As well. is is a, I wish I had that gun, God yeah. damn it! It sounds amazing. It should have a plasma <laughs> rifle on it too, right? Which would yeah. make it perfect. But, um, sounds like yeah. some ground troop shit for Battletech. It does. So we should I mean, be talking about it should is. Be, and should keep in mind, Battletech miss... was being written right about this time. Should we do the <laughs> missing in action series next? Oh yeah, Love not to. not just we'll not do Chuck as a whole. We'll just do Missing in Action. Missing in Action is just a fantastic franchise. So that could be next. Yeah. Missing in Action. Can't do all of Chuck. It's just too much. Just you know, only Chuck could do all of Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the the, the bigger so he's, he's definitely moved up to the bigger armament. We got the the wild wild wildly little wildly uh, the. Machine gun and the rocket launcher in this one, which is, uh, he's not taking any chances or prisoners, apparently. There are which, no prisoners. The rocket launcher is really interesting because I know exactly what it is and that's not what it behaves like at all. No, no. it's no. a cut down M72 or the front half of one, anyway, with a handle on it because the real one doesn't have a handle. Uh, no. One of the things I like about this, though, is that the neighbors all start to help him. So he's not in his own here. He's getting a lot of help from the neighbors. They've fed up to. Uh, you see Rodriguez there helping him with the machine gun. Martin mm -hmm. uh, Balsam's character Bennett is is uh, involved. They're they're all starting to, and they get out there and cheer every time a teenage thug is blown away. They're cheering. I, I, I love I love that in this movie where uh, even the ones who aren't helping him directly are kind of rooting for him still. Yeah. <laughs> And like none of them will ever give the cops a description of him, and they'll give him all sort. They'll give them all sorts of like you know bullshit descriptions of like you know yeah. a tall black man to a woman, to all sorts yeah. of other things. And the cops like, are just like, no. We know correct me if I'm wrong though. Uh, did the cops not implicitly, explicitly say to him, "You can be, you can do what you like here as long as you you inform us." going on or am i thinking of death well Wish i think 4? that's the detective is just basically like hey you can take care of as many of these dickheads as you want just tell me about it first yeah there's and, there's a sort of a deal and and then certainly that um ed lauter his police chief ends up being on his side i mean it, either you fight with him or you die at the end because it's yeah right <laughs> I know you're going to choose to side with them in the end if you have or to. Or like these poor, like these poor people, you know, you fight with them and you die in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and is it also really to me? It strikes me that that you can basically declare war and run a war in the streets of Brooklyn, and pretty much you're allowed to get on with it. Well, I mean, that's that's called Tuesday in New York. It's Tuesday. <laughs> it's not really wrong. Uh, I mean, I'm yeah. glad I don't live in the city. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know who would want to these might, days. Uh, part of that might be my, you know, career-long bias as a Bostonian. 
of hating everything New York is and stands for. Oh my God. Yeah. That, that is totally Bostonian. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm the same. I'm the same way. Uh, yeah. I have yeah. no love for that. So I hope everybody in the chat still having good, good fun. I see a lot of you chatting. It's uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Hope you're enjoying this. We'll certainly be doing more Canon film club. Missing in action. Sounds like the next series to cover so sounds like uh, austin fun. has picked it yes i like this one i <laughs> has picked the soprano quote it was two I, black guys they ran that way officer tony soprano yeah, <laughs> yeah, <pretty well. laughs> yeah. and as well austin should pick it the the next ones we look at because he is the aficionado he is the writer I, of the guy I, I am i am just excited for all of this uh this uh, firearm knowledge that's being uh oh <laughs> yeah here yeah. yeah. Because those those movies got they have some some wildly modified weapons in there. And Canon movies in general have some really interesting weapons, including some pretty rare stuff. Yeah. That they only ever made like a couple hundred of that somehow. Well, Canon Paul, we should probably work on a, a, a just one stream that talks about the weapons. That would be a good idea. Um, That'd be an interesting one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention in Death Wish Two, Christopher Guest was in it as well. Forgot That's that. right. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I didn't have a picture of him, so I forgot mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. Chuck Norris died this We're afternoon. But he, it's okay. He's up. better now. It's literally. They're having the community meetings up. now oh, about who 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 are we going to gank next? <laughs> How best can we blow away some bad guys? <laughs> well, even just look at the size of the handgun in his hand. Like, it's the size of his forearm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It would blow me 10 feet backwards if I tried to fire that one. I, nine mm. millimeters is my limit. Now, no, no, actually, if it was a revolver, it would do that. That one wouldn't yeah. do that to you. No. But, uh, it's a beauty, yeah. though, isn't it? It's it's just it looks like it'd be way heavy to hold. I just looked up the data on it. There, uh, With that kind of barrel on it, it's about six pounds. So Elizabeth Young... Um, Sorry, it was the, the one before that. Martin Balsam has the typical old guy's house. It's got a lot of duck figures. <laughs> a lot of duck figures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really he's probably got plates on the wall. To, used to make duck decoys. He'll have plates on the wall too and you know, right. stuff like that. <laughs> Here's the first time in New York City that the sun's shined in, in 40 years. <laughs> Uh, it, it just the street scenes are all real streets with real shitty blocks. I mean, the only thing is that I'm surprised they didn't do it in Detroit because that's even worse. But. Well, once they start blowing things up at the end of the movie, it's all a set in London. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. That's true. Well, yeah. the end of this movie is magnificent because it's got a, a really long shootout sequence through various areas it's it's mm. pretty good it's, it's 20 minutes worth of that awesome guy music. always played a, an asshat too yeah. he's a great um, actor for that yeah though, he is he just plays a really convincing psychopath what is that yeah. guy's name um what is yeah that guy Hang on, I'm looking uh, gavin is it gavin o'hirely uh yeah yeah i yeah, can't please. pronounce that one it's so oh, really, irish, yeah, like, irish oh, is hard he's just, uh, amazing hurley Gallon and Hurley. Yeah, his... See, I, I was going to make this joke, but he's not firing a pistol, it's a hand cannon. <laughs> With a capital C. Well, pretty much. I mean... but yeah, he was in uh, a bunch of films that Gavin o I, I, I just him. watched him the other night, and uh, my wife had never seen Willow, the original one. Oh, and he's in right. that. Yeah, he is in that. Oh, yeah, better yeah, I than forgot. that. Look, there's better than that. He was Chuck Cunningham in Happy Days. <laughs> Who yeah, mysteriously right, disappeared right. after season one and was never mentioned again. <laughs> wow. Ever. <laughs> well, didn't he go off to Vietnam? No, they didn't mention him. What older brother? Oh, doesn't exist. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that. I grew up watching Happy Days. I mean, if you're going to write a guy out, that's the way to do it. Never right. mention him again. Ever. Yeah, never. Like, don't say what happened to him. He's just never mentioned again. Yeah, he was in uh, Lonesome Dove and Twin Peaks, a lot of stuff. Yeah, Prince Valiant, and this and, and this woman just proving the, this is a canon. I think just it? proving the point of if you touch Charles Bronson's dick within thirty six hours, you will die. Uh, that's right. It's it's the ultimate STD, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sexually, it's sexually transmitted death. <laughs> that's 
That's awesome. Yeah, never ever date Charles Bronson unless you're yeah, Joel Ireland. Don't even look at him. If you're Joel <laughs> Ireland, you can get away with it. You're allowed to leave. But yeah, this uh, the final sequence where they're, they're just shooting the shit out of everybody. And, and the thing is, is that people were saying, you don't know who's in these crowds. I mean, there could have been a few innocent people. <laughs> what the hell? Mm-hmm. Can't make an omelet. I mean, it's New York, so not right? Really innocent. Collateral damage. <laughs> yeah. hey, if it's oh. good enough for the government. But it is a very, very great uh, sequence at the end. I think, Austin, you talk about it in, in your book. Uh, just how good it is. The end, yeah. The, the, the cl- just wild, wild number of like high body counts. Yeah. Old buildings exploding. People flying off of motorcycles. That's it's- right. People getting shot by that gun and flying 10 feet in the air. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, As I, do, I do like I do like that scene though, where they have a whole bunch of people on bikes, and then you know they just race that freaking chain right across the road. Yeah, <laughs> which multiple, yeah, the, the, that last the last twenty minutes, multiple city blocks. As you say, people are flying off motorbikes, buildings are exploding for no apparent reason. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little old lady is set on fire, and the police yeah. are just staying the fuck away from it. They're just like, no. We want nothing to do with whatever's gone over it's, there, and it, it's a big, big contrast from the first two. It's to me, it's a much more over the top, but funnier and more exciting sequence as a result. You know, one of the things that always cracks me up is Bronson's buddy in this movie, the guy who's whose wife died. He's got this little tiny like zip mm-hmm. gun or something. Meanwhile, Bronson's got this whole arsenal. Like, why doesn't he <laughs> give his like his his yeah, friend yeah. here? Like, an that's actual, the hilarious like, part is. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Hispanic guy, I think his name is Rodriguez. Like you said, the, it was a zip uh, gun, which is literally just a piece of pipe, like two pieces of pipe. I think together, Rodriguez is, is the guy that's helping him with the machine gun. I think he's a good yeah, guy. And he has, like, this, yeah. this zip gun, which is basically just two pieces of pipe and a firing pin and a 12 gauge shell <laughs> that's essentially no better than a musket. And then you have Bronson next to him with a Bronson 1919. Needs. A condition known as Bronson needs. Yes. Don't ever date Charles Bronson. Don't ever touch him <laughs> in the groin. And this, this is, is where so Lord cool. has to has to team up with him. There's no there's no getting around that. I mean, he can't not team up with him. Um, it is a fabulous sequence. A lot of people think it's the best film uh death best death wish i know a lot of people in the chat said it's their favorite um, canon i movie. would say that it's up there i'm it's definitely my it's favorite a tie between wish. this and two for me yeah hey courtney good to see you i know you couldn't make it into the stream today but it's awesome to see you last um oops i leap to the end rather quickly um but we do have the we do have the ending scene to show after that well let's say the end the the, the rocket launcher scene um, because you can't finish a Death Wish movie, movie from three onwards without a rocket launcher. No, it's it's the law. You have yeah, to have it, at it, least it, one it, rocket launcher. But and you only have these Hollywood rule books, which now are all about gender or whatever. Then it was must have rocket launcher. Yeah, yeah and, and apparently apparently Hollywood shit, rocket movies wouldn't get greenlit great. without an action sequence like this. Yeah, son of a red shirt. We will. There's a lot of good ideas in there, um, so yeah. we'll definitely put Uncommon Valor on the list for sure. Uh, yeah, so great movie. I do want to show the rocket launcher. See, I know we saw a tiny clip of it earlier, but I think it's worth because it's just so memorable. Just showing um, uh, clips. Here we go. Uh, rocket. If I had a rocket launcher, here we go. So this is. Um, this is peak late death wish. Just like yours. Stages like that. You can't have both of us. Let me. Apparently, right out the window. rocket launchers don't have back blast. <laughs> no. And also, apparently, they don't have a minimum arming distance, which they do <laughs> in real life. <laughs> Luke, you have to suspend your disbelief willingly here. 
Well, I mean, <laughs> there's a reason now. that minimum arming distance exists. So you don't Come on now, folks. It was the 80s. Distance. You know, the laws of physics were different back then. I, 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 was, just impre- I was, was impressed by the fact that a 65-year-old man could pick that thing up quickly enough to fire well, it in time. Well, the laws are actually guy. very light. They're all made I was out of fire say, glass, uh, so. Is that what that was, Pope? Yeah, it's it's it was an, a law it's rocket? The fr- it's, the front sev- it's the front half of an M72 with the back end cut off and a uh, handle. Yeah, I was fixing to say, added, I don't remember there somehow. being a handle on those. There you wasn't. just ripped it open and put punched yeah, the button on the like, top. It's literally yeah. the front half of that tube, <laughs> just without the telescoping part, and yeah. they added a handle. So it's just an empty reason. tube. That's all it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> you like the touch paper that went in. No, if you hey, look for any civilian that doesn't understand what he's talking about, about back blast and all that stuff, mm. the best scene with a law rocket in it is a movie, The Enforcer. It's a yeah. Dirty Harry movie where they oh, yeah. test. They actually go mm. to a test site on a military base to show them what a law rocket will do because apparently the mm. bad guys have them and they want to know what it does. Yeah. And it's 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 pretty good and it's very accurate. But so that's why I'm surprised to know that was a law man, rocket. I, 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 the window, the magic of movies. I, I think that's a good segue because uh, Death Wish Four was written by the writer of the Enforcer. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The, it just uh, what you point out. He didn't strictly speaking shoot him through the window. He shot him and blew the window out and half of the wall at the same time. Yeah. So really, it he wasn't blew him anywhere the except the part. <laughs> well, the, the, like especially as someone who came up in a heavy machine gun and anti tank platoon, that's you. You do get to learn that very quickly. Of yeah, this thing's going to have an effect of um, not just what you're aiming at, but also the general vicinity around what you're aiming at. Oh, so, and uh, by the way, Chuck wouldn't have a hair left on his head if he was that close to a wall when he shot it. Uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> right. I got one more little clip from this before we move on to Death Wish 4, and this is the one of my personal favorites from the movie. Possibly even my favorite scene. All that stuff was great. I like this one. Hey. What's the problem? What? With the car. What's the problem? Just get out of my fucking face. Who are you? We're stealing the fucking car. What's it to you? It's my car. <laughs> How you going to die? <laughs> That's peak courtesy right there. It's oh, my it's- car. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just like a thug brings a knife to a gunfight? A gun yeah. Fight. yeah, and everyone's oh god, I've actually dealt with that in real life. It's just like yeah. anybody who has a switchblade, you're automatically a retard. Yeah, because you are going to be outgunned by whoever you get in a fight with. But the switchblades are some of the worst weapons of all time. I do have to say that is my favorite scene in that movie. Despite all the awesomeness later, that one is just. I love the simplicity of it, where it's just like, it's my car. What's what's the problem with the car? (laughs) Yeah, anyway, so Death Wish 3... And Soul Assassin says it right. They brought a knife to a Bronson fight. They brought a rocket launcher fight. Um, They didn't... Death Wish 3... um, Let me get some images up. It made pretty good money. Not as much as 2, but... Still made them a profit. I think it was like 16 million domestically and a 10 million budget. But when you figure in international and all the video rentals, but then it was. When you look at it, 10 million bucks is a lot for a Canon movie. Well, half of that was Chuck's salary, wasn't it, Austin? Yeah. And and the the box office was where that was all just icing on the cake to them at that point because they had made, they'd paid for the movie by selling it abroad, selling it to video, selling it to HBO and the movie channel already. And yeah, exactly. That's one of the cool parts that you won't see anymore is people selling a you know fairly decent movie or even a B movie to all of these other channels and basically being in the black before it ever sees the theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was Canon's Canon's model was yeah, sell it and if we haven't made haven't made it yet, but we'll sell it. You know. So is yeah, Chuck trying to look younger? The they could get people to buy films before they'd ever even shot a scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is Chuck trying to look younger by hanging out with young people or something? What's the deal? Yeah, it's, uh, that's his um, rap 
act behind so, them. They're, they're going to do the dancing and the singing. It's a Michael Jackson video at this point. So speaking it's like, of, it's, it, it's like the line days and yeah. fuse, where you know the best things about high schoolers is you know you keep getting older and they stay the same age. Yeah. <laughs> so Deathwish for two years later, um, no longer my winner was apparently not available. Uh, G. Lee Thompson takes over, which I think is actually a great thing. He's a, he's a very very capable director. Uh, you know, you know you're going to get a decent movie, even on a low budget. Of J. Lee Thompson, Cape Fear, Guns of Navarro, and all these other great movies he made. And then all the great canon movies he made, a lot of them with Charles Bronson. So there was no problem there. I think that was good. Uh, written by, you, know, you somebody mentioned this. It's written by Gil Morgan Hickman, who wrote The Enforcer. Yeah, Austin said that. Yeah. Yeah, Austin said mm -hmm. that, and then Murphy's Law, which is another great movie. And had written a script for Death Wish 3, but got passed over. I think that's right, Austin. Yeah, that was back in the days when Ken was working so fast to get these movies from the concept to into theaters mm -hmm. that they would sometimes pay two or three people to write scripts, and they would just pick their favorite out of them. So a lot yeah. of times those scripts ended up being recycled and used for other things. Especially well, and I think in the last episode, uh, we were talking about, like, you know, some of the process to get a movie greenlit and was basically you had 30 seconds with Menachem and mm -hmm. you know he's just like all right what do you got yeah <laughs> they then, they used to good enough they, they <laughs> used to say his enough. secretary was the most powerful person at canon because if you get a meeting with Menachem you can get your movie made it's just mm -hmm. getting the meeting with him was the tough part yeah and uh the uh He's a good writer, though. I mean, I don't know what's happened to him since or how many other things he wrote after this, but at the time he was good. I mean, The Enforcer's a great movie. I mean, there's no, no doubt about oh, it. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it, it, actually, you know, when it comes to the Dirty Harry franchise, I think really I'm, I'm one of those people that thinks there were only three Dirty Harry movies. Everything after mm -hmm. that wasn't very good, you know. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, The right. Enforcer's great. That whole scene where they, they're chasing the guy through the city and she's got the bomb in a briefcase the whole time, smacking it against walls and all kinds of shit. And, and I'll oh, agree yeah. with that as a man who's a lifelong fan of Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. Like, the man just, I mean, after th third Dirty Harry movie, it just kind of gets old. It does, yeah. No, I, I, they're all good. So I actually think by this time, people might say, well, this is the fourth one that's cheaper budget, diminishing returns. I actually think this is a really good movie. Three and four are excellent movies, still stand up well today. Um, there's, well, like again, you say, there's, on a diminished budget, this movie is better than has any right to be. Absolutely, and I think that's because of the direction, because of the script, because it's got a lot more of less Kelsey blowing people away and more thinking of ways to trap them into stuff he's using his mind he's trying to be clever there's a lot of humor in it he still and blows I wish people we had a razor here for this but he almost turns into the shadow in four and five a little bit it's much more um you know sh shenanigans and plots than he's using his mind as opposed to just straight blowing him away he still well, blows that, people well, away of course in incarnations of the shadow he's basically using like the things that the bad guys have done wrong to kill them. Yeah. And is so that Danny Trejo? That is Danny yes, Trejo. Wow. Danny Trejo. Cool. In an mm -hmm. early ish role for him. Uh, he did, he did several canon movies. Right. Yeah. Guy doesn't age. I'm not sure he <laughs> He's looks always good. looked 70. <laughs> I'm not sure he looks good in the suit, though. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he was in, he was in Runaway in Train and Penitentiary 3. That's right. This uh, In the same span of like two years for canon. Yeah. Runaway Train's a great movie. Yeah, uh, Penitentiary. Runaway Train is my favorite canon movie of all time. Yeah. I love so that movie. Yeah, so and good. the the main big bad in this is the canon wonderful canon regular John P. Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, and loads. I mean, Austin, you'll know how many films he's in. Loads of canon movies. <laughs> yeah, and it was one of those things where he was a guy who. He would come by the canon offices and everybody loved working with him and he could play like a, a, a really damn good villain. Yeah. And when he'd come into the office to collect his check, there'd be somebody there like Sam Furstenberg or J. Lee Thompson being like, oh, shit, you come be in my movie now. Yeah, yeah you got <laughs> he, would do it. he would do it. He was a yeah. great character actor. And he's the big bad. No, we're giving away. 
spoilers, I guess, for those who may not have seen them. But he is the ultimate baddie in this one, although he appears not to be for a, quite a long time. Um, basically funds Kersey and tries, because this is all about the drug war, the period yep. of the drug mm -hmm. war. So yep. this is all about cleaning up. what, 89, 1990? Eighty-seven. Uh, 87. 87. So there's not so much revenge, or there isn't revenge in there. It's more about cleaning up the streets in general. It moved on from that. So, um, so he plays the big bad, and he chews the scenery as usual. He's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, this I don't know. I can't remember the actor's name, but this is the video editing scene. He's a video editor. Mm -hmm. Just saw that in. guy the other night in yeah. uh, Air Force One. If it's the same guy I'm thinking of, he plays maybe. He yeah, plays the actually, national security advisor that gets blown away in the but, in the office there. Austin yeah. and I, were, I think we were all talking about this before the, the movie. This scene where Kersey goes into this video editing office or whatever it is, plastered with Canon movie posters. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Every movie is a Canon yeah. movie. You get Breakdance, yeah. Field of Honor. That's Kamora like, next to it. And yeah, I don't have the I full picture. Probably a second killing of the dog poster, the dark S one on the side. They yeah. I'm not making that movie, but pretty cool to see a full poster for it. And a lot of it was filmed in Canon offices, in the car park. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. anywhere anywhere that could um yeah. be cheap. And like, uh, like we've at the end of nineteen eighty five, if, if, if it didn't cost them money, they would do on. it. Sorry, Paul, yeah. hang on, Austin. I was gonna say at the end of nineteen eighty five, they they moved in this gigantic uh, five four facility in in Los Angeles, and yeah, you 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 bet they were going to film as many scenes as they could. Fifty two yeah. pickups, another great Canon movie that a lot of it was shot in the Canon offices. Yeah, quite right. Sorry, Pope, what you were saying? Which must have been really interesting if you worked in the Canon offices, like as like a you know page or whatever, and then they're filming a movie while you're trying to do your work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So I'm going to attempt again to play the trailer, see how much of it I can get away with. Um, here we go. So a trailer for Death Wish 4. And uh, the first one with a colon in the title. That cracked me. Yeah, the colon. <laughs> the dreaded colon. colon. <laughs> Music might kill this one again. I don't know. We'll see. I might get away with some of it. Looking for a new thrill. Hey, just like our promise. Yeah, sure. Yep. But this time, the thrill went too far. Crack has claimed another victim. Dealers are making up their own rules, and no one is able to stop them. Somebody has got to crack down. Who are you? Death. Oh. Charles Bronson <laughs> in the biggest death wish ever. They have to be stopped, cousin. Death Wish 4, The Crackdown spent a small fortune buying information on the major drug dealers in Los Angeles. I'll handle this my own way, no interference from you. He's working to destroy the drug empire. It's a It's either him or us. Now, Bronson is their target. The trap is set. Here he comes. The fuse is lit. The fuse is Bronson lit. is unleashed. The rocket launcher is primed. Charles Bronson, Death Wish 4, The Crackdown. Uh, you gotta love it. It's too funny. So, I just wanted to this, this comment from Son of a Red Shirt. You're forgetting the horribly <laughs> underrated. You're forgetting the horribly underrated break into electric boogaloo. As soon as Charles Bronson found out it was break into, he went and killed everybody involved. <laughs> he <laughs> killed the gas. He killed the friggin' grip. He killed everybody. It's a break in crime. <laughs> um, that's a really neat trailer, and I felt it has a lot lighter touch than the the other ones. And uh, yeah. there's some clever stuff in it. We'll show a couple of the, the clips. Seventies. John's yeah. got to go, but yeah, I got I got to go. Oh, sorry, mate. Yeah, sorry. That's fine. Uh, thanks for being here, my friend. Have you no. got anything uh, uh, you want to promote? Well, uh, <clears throat> tomorrow morning uh, on uh, Pop Culture Minefield, we've got uh, morning coffee with Brian, and we're talking about the Fermi paradox. Yes, we're on, trying to answer the big question: Is there intelligent life on Earth? Is that yeah. your last stream before your procedure, buddy? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. yeah. Well, good well, luck with I'll that. Be, we'll I'll all be, be thinking about you. Days, so. Well, we'll see you tomorrow I will, morning. I'll see you guys later. Yep. Take care, mate. Thanks care, for being mate. here. 
Uh, I gotta get. How do we? Oh, there he goes. He says, how do we get him out of here? He wants to leave. How do we get? He him wants out? to leave. How do we get him out? <laughs> So, uh, well, it's hard to leave when you can't find the door. That's right. Yeah. That's so let me just, uh, are we all still good for time? The rest of us, though? Oh, yeah. Uh, while yeah. we get through oh, Death yeah. Wish 4, mm-hmm. uh, let's throw some of these stills montages up then and uh, we'll start looking through it. And I've got a couple of clips we can show as usual at the end. So, uh, back in LA. Again, Chuck just doesn't coast, coast to coast. coast he can't to stay coast. Too, can't stay somewhere right. for too long. Man. Yeah, I mean, you blow up the city, and you have to leave for a while. So yeah, I mean, you know, um, that was interesting. Valentine McCallum. I wonder if that's a root, one of Jill Ireland's kids. It is. It is one of yeah. uh, Bronson's adopted children. <laughs> yeah, I just hmm. wondered that. Yeah, of course. Sadly, one of them. Um, yeah, one of the the boys. Uh, mm-hmm. Sad end, but uh, so Polly Latino slant is here. This is the one Danny Trejo was in. We actually yes. showed a picture of him earlier, and yes, sir. We, we will be showing a clip later of him getting um, enjoying a vintage wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's of a certain vintage. So I had to. Be, it's, uh, I think I had to cut drastically that opening scene because there's a lot of bits that you can't really show on YouTube. Uh, but once again. That was a dream. He was, Kersey's dreaming that he's <laughs> killing somebody that's killing a bunch of guys that are uh, graping somebody. So, hey, Paulie, you can join the stream if you want, you know, to see, and I'll send you the link. Uh, I will say four and five kind of, um, like the first 10 minutes of five, you just can't put on any sort of public television or whatever. Yeah. Because there's just boobs everywhere. I know, and I may have missed one or two. I don't think I have because I, I carefully went through all the images, but. Um, so here's um, here's a woman getting who's never never studied Paul Kersey's history, getting dangerously close to him <laughs> once again, and then the daughter is suffering from uh, from the, the cracks. Crack was a big epidemic, and everyone had the cracks. So it's kind of personal, but it's kind of clean up the streets too. Um, same text vineyards, and, <laughs> it's and, like and new Napa Valley vineyards. Same text it. <laughs> <laughs> vineyards. Um, yes, yeah, so I, yeah, it's, it's it's in some ways I do like this movie a lot. I think possibly three slightly better. Although, again, there's some brilliant stuff towards the end of this with the roller rink and um, all that kind of chasing Paul John uh, P. Ryan's character through the parking lots, the roller rink, uh, bumper car scenes. And there's some great set pieces in this, uh, all filmed within two minutes of the canon office. Um And he does spend an awful lot of time um, uh, you know, kind of getting his shit together before he really gets on with it, uh, so to speak. Yeah, well, when that's, does that's he have really time to do question, architectural Robin. stuff? Yeah. <laughs> when does he have time to build anything? Because he's busy destroying things most of the time. Excuse me. Of course, this one, John P. Ryan's character invites him in to say, I'm going to fund your efforts to wipe out these drug gangs because I lost somebody to them too. And so there's a mob element in this. Um, so a little bit more kind of hackneyed in a plot sense, I think. I don't know if you'd feel the same, guys. But, you know, it's, a, it's a little more forced, but it does seem like something he would do. Yeah. But the, as you say in, in your wonderful Canon Film Guide Volume 1, Austin, marvellous book. Please, everyone, go buy it. No, thank you. Uh, uh, it's There are references in this to Kurosawa. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is very much you're pinning the bad guys against each other. And, um, I mean, yeah, Kurosawa and then re- redone in the, the spaghetti westerns with Eastwood, yep. Sergio Leone and... It has that flavor to it. Yeah, he plays them off against each other, particularly with the oil um, Derek scene where 
the two gangs are called together to supposedly make peace and then runs and shoots one of them in the head and the rest start shooting each other. <laughs> so, uh, so that's pretty neat stuff. Uh, there is quite a good fight scene in here where you think Bronson, uh, Kersey's in trouble. He's getting beaten up quite badly by the guy, but he ends up throwing him backwards into a drinks cabinet, I think, and the guy cuts his head. Now, here's the, would you like this, uh, would you like a bottle of wine scene, which we're going to show the whole scene later. But uh, He does make quite a convincing wine salesman. <laughs> but he leaves rather quickly when say <laughs> everything he does is convincing. Yeah. It's uh so that's the clever part. He's not just taking a gun out and shooting them all there. He's actually uh, there's there's a the, chainsaw behind uh, him. Yeah, uh, here you go. Uh, there there you go. The there's a good shot of it. Yeah. So name those name those movies. We've got Forced Witness, Kimura. Breakdance. Fields of Honor, Breakdance. Mm. Invasion USA looks like. Invasion USA. <laughs> what else can we see? There's a bunch of them. I actually can't see the screen right now. I don't know oh, why. It's sorry, mate. Yeah, that's oh, okay. It's it's. I I love that they were willing to reference them. In fact, that probably is one of the video editing rooms at Canon Studios. It probably it is. is. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> In the new offices. Well, there's look, there's a witness uh, uh, lobby card there. Did you see that? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But their um, cops are after them as well. Uh, they're just, yeah. Plot-wise, kind of standard. But there's mm -hmm. nice scenes in it, I think. No, she's she's the glamour <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> wow, she looks interested. She's very glamour <laughs> actress. I don't know who she is, I'm sorry. She's probably somebody. She has a couple of good points in the movie. A couple of good parts. Um <laughs> There's the scene where he gets the, the the guy is beating him up a bit, but Kersey throws him backwards into that shelf and uh, cuts his because it cuts his neck on the, the glass of it. So, mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know what it was like for Charles Bronson. He must have been about seven, nearly seventy now, filming those kind of action scenes. And how much of it was a double? How much was him uh, really? You, know, you, you can can't tell. You can start to see it at this point. This film, it's not as bad, but. There's a movie he made around the same time, Assassination, hmm. which has some of the worst stunt double work you'll you'll ever see. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> like Charles Charles Bronson goes from being 66 years old to being like a 20 year old guy who's like a foot taller than him in a bad way. This movie's like mustache porn. Yeah, uh, it's the eighties. It's the eighties. Now I love this whole bit though, where this is the the tuna. You can't tuna fish but you can tuna fork kind of thing this is where they're in the tuna factory and of course the fish are being used to smuggle drugs <laughs> like you would never have guessed that never and he shoots the shit out of it which is nice and i've got that scene too we'll, we'll show that in a minute but, uh, i can't remember at what point he discovers um john p ryan is the ultimate bad guy well here he's doing some architect work <laughs> yeah, so whoever was asking that before, like he does actually do architectural stuff. I was fixing to say, I've seen a couple of slides stories. with him with buildings, uh, models of buildings and stuff. Yeah. He actually yeah, does they're this actually for like really good, well done models, but when does he have time to make them? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so not a good look. Um, no, not a good look. Not a good look. Not a good but you know it does it does move some of these scenes are pretty good um i think generally there's a there's an awful lot of talking in it too but um <laughs> oh here we go with the mobsters getting together oh uh, we should plan it yeah Polly, you and i it's been a while we need to stream brother we need to stream we need to do something together i got and, an idea uh, for both of you uh we might want to talk about after is it to do with mustaches well, yes, Polly's got the best mustache on YouTube. Right to say, pa Polly's the mustache. only one I've ever seen that can rival Bronson for sure. Can, no yeah. doubt. No, this is the oil derrick scene, which is pretty clever and it is very uh, Kurosawa playing them off against each other. Uh, basically, that's the end of the two mob gangs. 
So then the real boss can take over. That's it. Yeah. One of the cops is crooked. I can't remember which one that's chasing him because that causes a bit of an issue because Kersey has to kill him. And then the other cop, of course, doesn't like that because he said you killed a cop. Well, he's he was a bad man. And I don't care, he says. No. Uh, now, the girl... I think this is the one where his girlfriend gets uh, put into a car by the bad guys and then roll down the hill. No, wow. I think that's, that's, that's three. Was that three? Boy, okay, yeah, yeah that was a, yeah. A, an object lesson and never let the woman drive if you if she's connected to Paul Kersey. I mean, in general, really, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, Austin. He lost the beanie after two, right? He did. He's just, he's yeah. just all stuck. Uh, uh, from three yeah. on, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he doesn't have the beady anymore. No. Yeah, which is... I wonder if that was a deliberate decision by the writers or whether Bronson just said, nah, it's not working for me now or just didn't Bron fit the mood. Bronson had 90% of the control on these movies by this point, so... Mm. <laughs> I would say it was yeah. probably his choice. And I don't think it really fitted because he wasn't stalking them in the streets anymore. It was much no, more planned. No, no, he much loftier plans now he had mm -hmm. to have he had to have a face that they could see right what is there blood all over the building as i said earlier those buildings would have all sorts of the machine gun nests booby traps sniper pits uh, closets well, for putting I mean, guns in, you know. When, when you look at it, it's the perfect cover for, you know, a guy like Paul Kersey is, you know, when you whack a whole bunch of mobsters, whatever, you just put them in the basement and then fill them in with concrete. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, and Arch Architect's going to have a lot of creative places to hide bodies, isn't he? Yeah, uh -huh. so yeah. The, he tells the, the concrete guys, could you just hold off for a day or two before you pour the foundations? I'll just be with you in a day or two. Just don't do it yet. <laughs> Just don't I'm, not ready that, yet. I'm not telling you why. that thudding sound in the mixer it's fine yeah now this stuff was great i love the foot the, the shoot out in the roller i mean so he is a roller disco come on mm -hmm. has anyone yes. ever been to a roller disco yeah when i was a little kid yeah yeah i was fixing to say uh, i spent a lot of time at the roller rink when i was a kid yeah yeah uh, but there were great places to hang out you know arcade yeah, machines were. whatever yeah uh, but this this is a great sequence and of course he makes the fatal mistake of kidnapping Kersey's girlfriend uh, but then again she compounded the mistake by being Kersey's girlfriend which was a, that's true. you're wrong that's for that unless comedy. your name's Jill Ireland you are wrong for that completely yeah. but this is where he says to the cop I'm just going to do what I'm going to do basically you can shoot me if you want I've got a mission to do walks away but we're going to see the uh, the actual ending but uh, on, we've got a couple of video clips so uh, let me just call those up and we can see some of the fine moments, the finest moments from Death Wish 4. Uh, first of all, let's start with uh, oh, the exploding wine, I think, would be the one to start with. Uh, <laughs> exploding wine, yes. Let's see what your customers say. Uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. They'll love it. A little bit quiet, <laughs> Gentlemen, there's Danny. Your lucky day today. Bottle of wine on the house. Hey, not bad. Hey, don't I know you from someplace? I don't think so. Yeah. I know your face. Did you ever live in San Francisco? Uh, I'm from Idaho. Hey, I got a brother in Idaho. <laughs> what city? Boise. Boise. I know you. I never forget a face. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> wow! Now I've drank some explosive wine in my time, but usually not in that direction. But come on, <laughs> that's a neat scene. Uh, I get two more before we uh, talk about the movie in general. Oh, the fish market scene. Shall we watch that? Let's. Oh see. yes. Go, man! This is just great. Love this. Look at the fish getting <laughs> the shit show out. That's just a little clip of it, but wow. it's an awesome scene. I just love that. 
the Mac 10, when you have n- yeah. no care how many bullets you're going to fire <laughs> and don't care if you're going to hit anything. Well, what, like I said earlier, the Mac 10, when you want, want to hit everything except where the front side post is pointing. Wasn't it, what did they used to say? Just pre and spree? That's, That's literally what that gun was designed to do. It's it's literally just whip it out, and, and the barrel is, I think, three inches long. Yeah, so it's not it's long at all. Not all that much That's longer That's what than she said. <laughs> Freezing. Um so this this is the uh and this is the ending and again it's a rocket launcher ending but it is a good one because the, the bad guy kills his girl i mean they're ridiculous I warned you, I tell her. so i warned you i tell her vaporized vaporized no doubt and the thing about Which, that is, I think, that, I think that visual effect would have been much better with the actual sound of a 203 firing, where it's yeah. just this really Boom. almost comic thump. Boom. That's what <laughs> yeah. it sounds like. Uh, so, uh, and the thing is, he keeps saying, I warned you, as if it's going to make any difference. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, the man is holding an M16. Uh, I wouldn't really be talking shit right now. <laughs> so we're going to end the poll that was in the chat. If everybody's been doing the poll, we're going to end it. And we'll see what the results yeah. are. Okay, we have the results of. So I only I asked the question of the three Canon productions. Which is your favorite? And out of seventy six votes, if this will ever pop up for me to highlight, um, I'll just copy it and paste it in myself. So the results you can do are. It. I, have I can faith. do it. I do. So the results okay. are. Coming in first was Death Wish 2 at 51%. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but, you know, it's fair, right. it's valid. Death Wish 3 was second at 36%. And I'm Death Wish 4, low, yeah, Death Wish 4 the crack down at 11%. And 76 votes is a fair collection, I would say. So Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's a fair sample size, so yeah. Yeah, I... I Personally, if I was to vote for one, I'd go for Death Wish 3. Um, what about you guys? So, Austin, if you were to pick one of those three. I I love the ending. I love this really the second half of three. But if I'm going to throw one on, it's usually going to be four. And it's mm-hmm. probably because that, I think that was my first Death Wish movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, really. VHS. Yeah. Is it? It is, is it, it is entertaining and it's a little bit lighter than the others. A little and I, I love John P. Ryan. John P. Ryan's such mm-hmm. a such a great, great character actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Joe, have you got, of those three, and we haven't talked, one in five I excluded of those three. Yeah, right. We're just talking about the three that Canon made. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'd say three. The one where you're blowing up half of New York, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. The more of go, New York you can blow up, the more I like it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Pull I got to go with three. I mean, it has the coolest <laughs> guns. It has some of the coolest scenes. I mean, he shoots the giggler. Like, <laughs> you can't just, like, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. The giggler. I mean, it sounds like a Batman. It really um, does. It does. <laughs> Imp, how about you? Uh, it's three for me. Three for you. Yeah. It's first one, like, you know, people said it's the first one I saw when I was younger. It's the beginning of the over the topness that the Death Wish movies continued with after that point. So it wasn't too too far over the top, but it was just the right amount of holy shit, that was awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the first time we do get to see Charles Bronson with a belt fed. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, in the yeah, Death yeah. Wish series, anyways. True, yeah. Uh, I agree. I, I that's why I like three. I think it's got the right combination of, of grit, but also some silliness and, and uh the, the the closing twenty minutes where he goes city block to city block and wipes these guys out is as fun as you'll ever get. And also it, it has a lot of screen time for one of the largest and sexiest handguns I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I know yeah. he introduces that he's got the machine gun, he's got the rocket launcher, it's got all, all the elements. Like, and that's one of those things, kind of like Dirty Harry's, uh, you know, Smith and Wesson Model Twenty Nine, where you yeah. know that people were going out and buying that gun just because it Bronson had it. Yeah. Yeah. Another. Yeah. And see, so after watching Death Witch Three, this is how I feel. <laughs> that's, a fair, that's a fair a little point. bit of bow so makes me feel like that 
<laughs> yeah, man. Uh, yeah, and yes. so I think the consensus on the panel is more leaning towards three. But if you were, would it make a difference if we included one and five? I mean, would any of those turn the tables and say, well, one of those two? I, I I love one just because it's the one. One is an most. amazing movie, but I think three is still my favorite okay. overall. Austin, you're not going yeah. for five. One, one, one will jump into third place for me at best. Right. It's, it's good, but I'll, I like four and three more. So five isn't number one for you. Five. I mean, just for the soccer ball kill. I mean, I it's <laughs> bad, <laughs> one one. I, I yeah. have to judge between that and two. Like, and that scene like, that we cannot show on YouTube at all is one of the greatest scenes yeah. of all time for a couple of reasons. And I don't. <laughs> Have uh, I've got a trailer for five, I, but I don't I have anything cannot else. Impress upon you enough, Hollywood. There's nothing wrong with boobs. Show them Indeed. what's wrong yeah. with you. I, yeah, as I say, I don't have a, a great deal of material from five because I I'd run out of prep time, and it isn't officially canon. Canon, canon, canon. It is uh, 21st century film productions, which is obviously connected. Uh, it was made in 1994, so 20 years after the first one, I guess. Wow. Um, I think Bronson got, I'm right in saying Austin, got like a $5 million paycheck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he His paycheck was more than the rest of the film cost. I think it was yeah. a $7 million budget. Yeah, when you look at that the timing, time. being 20 years after the first Death Wish... That would make Charles Bronson almost 80 years old. Yeah, he was 73 when <laughs> he shot yeah. Death Wish 5, which is crazy. Wow. Which is insane. Is. Yeah, so and, and, and we think Harrison Ford's nuts for doing another Indiana Jones. Right? So it was called Death Wish 5, The Stair Lift of Death. <laughs> um, was the... Uh... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. <laughs> I will burn in hell for that. I know. Um, he's got rocket launchers <laughs> mounted on his friggin' walker, right? He's yeah. got the walker. Yeah. You know, these things they call them the Zen frames for walkers. He's got machine guns and rocket launchers. Sorry, Charles. And, and, and I get, I mean, he'd lost a lot of interest in movies, I believe, mm -hmm. by then because of the death of his wife, because of other things. Uh, and it was a good paycheck, though. And he did some TV. Obviously, it was much more comfortable to make the TV stuff. Um, it's not a good poster, it's true. And the backing music, too. No, um, Sorry about that. <laughs> so it didn't make a lot of money. Did not make a lot of money. I think that was the end of the, the road for those. But mm -hmm. uh, Golan, I guess Golan felt it was one more kick at the can. 21st Century Film Corporation is another story of its own, of course. But, oh, I, think, um, I think Brett Harlow uh, has a great comment where, you know, it's one of the few uh, New York, New York, and London getting blown uh, blown to shit, and yeah, make every Bostonian and Scotsman pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Deathfish Seven, where are my pants? Yeah, wasn't there a spoof Death Wish in some movie? A spoof Death Wish ninety poster or something? Or um, Simpsons. I know. I Simpsons. Know that Simpsons. Simpsons. In? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was yeah, gonna say, I yeah. know they did like you know, Rocky 5000 in space. It was and stuff Mr. Like Burns, right? yeah. And Mr. Burns was in Death Wish 90 or something, yeah. Um, <laughs> The Simpsons, yeah. So, I, I guess one other question before we start to wrap up would be, uh, oh, oh, not movie, but would there be a favorite scene for you in these movies? Like, if you had to pick one. What would it be? You're going to laugh at me. My favorite scene, and it's from the first one, is the handgun thing at the end of it. I That's love really that. Cool. that no, yeah. it, it's classic. It, it, it just, it's an iconic scene. Like, I'm going to get you. You know, I'm here for you. Yeah. That's how, yeah. And it's how playfully he does it, too. Yeah. Just like, to He's smiling end. the whole time, like, yeah, yeah. I'll get mm. you, buddy. <laughs> that makes it cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Austin, have you got a particular favorite? Oh, man, I, I, this is, it, it's hard to pick, but one of the things that always sticks to, sticks with me in three is just Charles Bronson going to the uh, post office to pick up his mail order guns. Oh, yeah. And it's just, uh, <laughs> it, that, I, that I, is I, a thing I, that happens. I, my sister living in New York lived 
right around the corner. That was like her post office for a long time. And it was where Charles Bronson, I knew it from the place, but it's also just a few blocks away from the building where in Home Alone 2, Kevin McAllister like t takes on the, the wet bandits. That's so it's, right, yeah. it's kind of funny that Paul Kersey and Kevin McAllister within like a few years were taking out crooks in the same, same like three block radius of New York, Upper West That's Side. Funny. Wow. I'm amazed New York survived it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> between all their traps, the two, those two. Yeah, um, yeah, I like that. that there's, sometimes it isn't always the most spectacular scenes that are the best in any movie. It's, uh, um, Pope, did you give us your favorite? Um, favorite scene? I, I'm really torn between a couple of scenes in Death Wish 3 where... He's trying to like, te where he's teaching like a bunch of the residents how to build traps and stuff, and it's literally just like, oh, we never thought of that, <laughs> and stuff like that. And then just, um, the where you see the nineteen nineteen get unveiled for the, unveiled for the mm -hmm. first time because that's just gun porn in all of its glory. Yes, it is. Good lord. <laughs> uh, and there is just no topping that. But Death Wish 3, I think, has the best scenes out of all of them. Especially the first time you see Wildy, where it's just like, holy shit. <laughs> like, it's impractical as hell, but I love it anyway. The yeah. line from the script is where that gun is unveiled. Because it's unveiled by name in the script because it was Bronson's weapon and he had it written into the movie. But it's the most, like, erotic, like, mm -hmm. three lines <laughs> that only have to do with, like, an inanimate object that you, you'll ever you'll ever read. <laughs> Will these hit? Yeah. yeah. Um, Imp, have you got a particular favorite? Uh, it would probably be from Death Wish One, believe it or not. Mm. And that's the Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. You're about to meet him. That two. is one of the that's best. Two. Lines that's in part two. That's yeah. two. Yeah. yeah. It is a great line, and it's it's not even just the line; it's the fact that you, the walking towards mm -hmm. the, it, guy. the whole the whole level of menace in that scene yeah. is just peak Bronson. And he's so mm -hmm. calm about it too. I'm just like, yeah, well, you're gonna meet him. <laughs> yeah, it is a tough choice because there's so many great moments, and and I do love these those three movies. I think, despite the fact that there may be, you could pick holes in them for various reasons. I think they're awesome, and I don't really care so much about the the critical criticisms of too violent vigilante. Where I like it, and they're fun, and I don't give a shit. And they're movies. Uh, it's who cares about the political stuff. Uh, I could possibly pick holes in Michael Winner's masochism uh, or sadism. Oh, bit. man, you could pick holes in anything. Uh, but I, mean, I think, for me, the best scene is, or my favorite scene, is is that car one where they're stealing his car. Yeah, the yeah, one you showed earlier. It. Yeah. It's, it's my funny. car. It's funny, but he still blows people away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, that's the awesome part about that scene is it's just like he's just matter-of-factly talking and then just blows the two of them away in a yeah. second. It just yeah. comes out of nowhere. He pulls, it, it, he pulls the gun and just wastes them. Doesn't even play mm -hmm. around about it. I, uh, I didn't. I had a lot of clips. I never had time to get around to playing, so my apologies for that. Um, I'm just looking for any that we might want to play one more before we go. Uh, if you've got any of the boobs, uh, go for it. No, no there's no boobs. No boobs. <laughs> oh, we've got this be, one. We'll be after the show. Sorry. Here's right? one we here's one we, as a closer before we wrap up and promote things. Here's a here's our uh, a final death that we didn't cover. Oh, yeah. oh. From deceleration Wish, trauma. It's never good roof. for you. It's a, it's a different one because he doesn't shoot the guy. He's off the roof. So, you know, Death Wish. You guys ever seen that movie, uh, uh, Running Scared? It's one of my favorites. Yes, with Billy Crystal and, and uh, Gregory Hines. Yeah, they're talking about a guy getting thrown off a roof. and the, uh, We got the cause of death back. He's like, wait, don't tell me. Deceleration trauma. And the other, the other guy goes, cement poisoning. <laughs> That's yeah, I just wanted to say hi to our friend Danius Munchausen, who... Apparently, he was asking me to resend him the link on Twitter, and I didn't. Sorry, mate. <laughs> you, do, you do have it in Gilded, and you have admin rights to this studio, so you can come in anytime. But my apologies for not noticing that message um, and not sending it to you. I do did want you here, Darius. And uh, 
we'll do it again. You'll be back. Uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for being in the chat. We'll go around the panel now and um, give you a chance to say your goodbyes, your tearful goodbyes. Say goodbye. And um, we'll start with uh, our great friend, Austin. So, Austin, what's happening in your world in the next few weeks? I'm just plugging away at volume three, trying to wrap up this uh, trilogy of canon film guides. And in the meantime, I am just, I'm, I'm, I'm always posting on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, just all sorts of 80s action movie stuff. So give me a, give me a follow there at, at canon film guide on either, either site. And you'll see all, all the things that I don't have room for in the book, stuff that I find afterwards, stuff that I'm stumbling across every day. It's just a, Fun avenue to share the, the, those things. Yeah, Keep the conversation and I, going. And I'm just looking for your uh, Twitter now, which I am obviously subscribed to because we exchanged messages. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I can uh, copy that link and put it in the, the chat. Well, let's hope I get the... Uh, I just found it. I got you. be following you. There you go, kind of film good. Uh, and let's just once again show you the website as well, www.canonfilmguide.com, where you can see lots of info about the first two books in the series. I, I can assure you they are a fantastic read, everybody. Just packed full of, of great info. And I love the pictures, all the VHS boxes that you found. <laughs> just <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, those are all sitting in boxes over, yeah. over this closet right to my right here. Just boxes yeah. and boxes of tapes. They're, they're a loving and beautiful guide to these films. How, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but in terms of the third volume, would you say you're a certain distance away? Uh, we're looking at late next year at the earliest. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it's still ways. a lot of work to do. Yeah, and yeah you do I've still got a lot of long ways to go. You do have some great interviews with uh, many of the players. On, in fact, if you ever get the chance to bring any of them onto the show, that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, good stuff, mate. Thank you again for Thank being you. here. No, Thank you very it's much. Our pleasure. Um, Joe, you reprobate. What's happening with yeah, you? I mate? know. I yeah, yeah. I I can't help it. I'm a dirty old man. I dig it. Um, Guys, it's it's been fun. Friggin' Charles Bronson is always fun to check out because I've always dug that guy. And like I said before, my mother thinks he's the the bee's knees. She's always <laughs> been in love with that guy. Um, what can you say about Death Wish, man? It's it's one of the greatest. For, it, it's one of the first franchises, action franchises. It really is. I mean, uh, when you really think about it, it, it started the vigilante thing in in hollywood you know I, I think the last movie i saw like that it was a vagilante movie it was uh uh peppermint i think was the name of it had the girl from uh alias on it i can't remember the girl's name used to be married to um uh, yeah that's it Jennifer oh, yeah. Garner. Jennifer Garner, yeah. yeah it was a pretty good movie uh but anyway for me, uh, you know, I've got Joe's uh, uh, State of the Atmosphere coming up. Uh, everything is on the channel. Just check it out. And I'm also on Pop Culture Minefield every Sunday for um, Dork Side of the Ring for the wrestling show. Uh, Doss Wolfen uh, runs that one for us. I don't know if he's going to do it this week because he's got his procedure. You guys send out good thoughts for uh, John. He's got a procedure Wednesday that he's getting done. And, um, and I'm always here at the beck and call of young 70s rock fan so you guys take care of yourselves i do thank like you. having people at my beck and call hey i'm always here for you on monday awesome. buddy always thanks. no i uh, love it mate thanks for being here mm -hmm. uh pope my her suit friend um what's happening with you buddy well uh next up i think is going to be you know our usual weekly show, Rock and Roll Religion, me and Imperatus are going to be covering the immortal band that is Emperor. Mm. Uh, second wave black metal oh, phenomenon no, yeah. that is probably my favorite of the second wave. And uh, we'll get into that. But uh, if you like the dark and evil side of metal, well, you know, you're coming to the right place. I know a guy who does. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the panel, as a matter of fact. He's on the panel. In fact, yeah. <laughs> 
Cool. Uh, but other than that, um, you can catch me every Monday on here and then every Saturday on Vets Talkins channel for Skin and Max Saturdays, which we also do a series of music reviews every now and again um, that have absolutely blown up beyond my expectations. I have no idea how or why we're that popular, but we are. So good, um, it's good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Roll with it, brother. Keep doing Absolutely, it. Man. Keep doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, thanks for being here, mate. Uh, Imp, you'll be excited about the Emperor stuff. Oh, yeah. They're one of my favorite bands, yeah. to be honest. You do so like a bit of you. light jazz, don't you? Oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> fusion jazz just really hits me in the right spot. Jazz fusion <laughs> gives him the feels. Yeah, the right. Feels. <laughs> Warm and fuzzy, you know. I got to drink a bottle of scotch. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so what else are you doing, though? Uh, not really sure this coming week. I do ha did do a stream last week. On Ended up going up on Twitch, but I'm going to download that and add it up to YouTube. Me and my buddy Nazmir and Shagsworth joined in for a bit, too, talking about the current state of multiplayer video games. So if you want to hear some ranting out of the three of us, oh, well, wow. where where do we find that? But on yeah, your channel, that's on my Twitch channel. But I am planning on uploading it to YouTube. Okay, great. That would be interesting for sure. Yeah. And Absolutely. we're probably going to be hitting that topic a couple more times because we did not get everything in, considering Nazmir is a Welshman, and the time difference is can't talk to the Welsh. Jesus <laughs> Christ, what's wrong <laughs> with you? I make an exception for him. I make the an Welsh? exception for him. No, the it's Welsh a subject are, I'm interested in, man, because I love multiplayer the, uh, video games. Very the Welsh cool. are like the Irish of Scotland. I mean, it's just ridiculous. They're just hey. so down, far down the... <laughs> yeah, well, here's the thing. He's smart. He wants to leave. There you go. Well, See? Yeah, that is... Yes, exactly. Uh, I could make some jokes, but I probably shouldn't. don't want to lose <laughs> any Welsh fans. Um, <laughs> so as for me, and thanks for being here. I always appreciate it, mate. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we always have a lot of fun. As for my good self, um, I will be sharing this screen if I can figure out how to do it. Oh, yeah, there we go. So tomorrow morning, uh, I will do, be doing my morning coffee with Brian on Pop Culture Minefield, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. And tomorrow's subject is the Fermi Paradox. Where is everybody? Why is no one talking to us? And is there intelligent life on Earth? So uh, I think the answer to that is no, but maybe that's why they're not talking to us. So we shall see. Uh, that's tomorrow morning. Uh, Thursday night, I'll be on the Comics Division special J Laws show. Oh, is that this Thursday? That's this Thursday. I will oh, be appearing on that. Well. Guys, uh, I've heard about what they're doing for the show. Dude, you got to yeah. watch. Well, I've prepared a few bits and pieces that will be on there, so I'm quite proud of them. That we can yes. be quite funny. Uh, and working on lots of new stuff for this show coming up. Some of it rock-oriented, some of it not. Uh, so there's some exciting, some exciting stuff coming, uh, which we're working hard on Uh so look forward to that. Roman, thank you for being here. And we have to get you on these shows, my friend. Um, absolutely. Got to get you on sometime. Now I've got to figure out how to get that chat off the screen. Where's my producer? You're doing one on my favorite rock band ever coming up. Soon. Oh, uh, yeah. So some later in the uh, third week in March, you and I and Christian are going to do Foreigner. So, But it's Hell a Wednesday yeah. evening. We're going to do a Wednesday evening show on that because I don't think the super heavy guys are into that. Uh, yeah, but there's lots more stuff, and uh, when it gets worked out, I'll get it all publicized. Uh, thank you to everyone in the chat for being here. There's so many names. Um, so many people, are, you're all great supporters of the channel, seeing a few name, new names to do. Thanks to the mods, Sentient Dildo, uh, Debud Martin, and others that were modding. Uh yeah, you're all wonderful people. Supported the show great. And uh, we'll be doing more of these canon, canon ones coming up. Uh, I think Missing in Action will be the next. So. Hey, man. <laughs> Austin, thanks for coming. Cause we, gonna... we dig these movies. And, know, and you appear to be I... the aficionado. Thanks for uh, showing thanks us. Thanks for having me. Tell us about We're it. Very gra me on. Grateful to have you here, Austin. Absolutely. So um, till next time, everybody. Uh, 
have a great night have a great rest of your week and keep on rocking keep on keeping on play outro and end stream as the button says <laughs>